Hello everyone, and welcome back to another What If video. Today we're going to look at a what if that will drastically alter Dragon Ball after Namek by sending Goku somewhere he's only found out about recently, the repugnant planet known as Vampa. Let's go to where it begins. After defeating Frieza on Namek, Goku quickly is trying to escape with the spaceship he found. Namek is exploding, and in just a few moments, the planet and Goku will be no more. He's pressing buttons left and right, all around, hoping it will launch somewhere or at least just take off from the planet into space. And at the last moment, it does, just as the planet explodes. In the original timeline, we saw that this ship originally fell into the planet as it was exploding, and Goku had to eventually find a Ginyu pod to escape the planet. This time, however, it actually does launch, and it works. So he launches off into space with a bigger ship and to a different faraway planet this time, Vampa. That's right, no Yardra this time around, which means no instant transmission. But that's not the most important part. You probably know what I'm referring to, so let's get right into it. After the journey, the ship lands on the planet, which seems pretty barren at first, except for a few spider creatures and giant furry beasts here and there. Goku tried to sense any power he could find, and it seems like there weren't any other powers there, but eventually he found two that seemed pretty interesting. Making a mental note of the ship's location, he goes out to find the source of these powers. Off on another part of the planet, Paragus notices something flying towards him. It's Goku. He thinks he's finally saved. After all these years of fighting to survive on this planet, him and Broly are finally saved as someone arrives to get them. It's also worth mentioning, Paragus hasn't started rapidly aging yet like Saiyans do once they reach a certain age, because this is happening in age 762 instead of 780, so there's an 18 year difference and Paragus is still younger. Technically, as a Saiyan, he still is in his prime, but he is nearing old age. Goku lands, and Paragus runs up to him instantly, and asks who he is and why he's here. Goku introduces himself, and he notices Paragus has a tail, and he asks if he's a Saiyan. Goku is surprised to see that there's another Saiyan alive, and Paragus is as well, as Goku tells him that he's a Saiyan too. Paragus asks if he knows any other living Saiyans, and Goku brings up that he does have a half-Saiyan son, but as for full-blooded Saiyans, he only knows one named Vegeta. Paragus is enraged, knowing that the prince is alive, and one of his cohorts is here. He gets aggressive towards Goku for being Vegeta's ally. But Goku tells Paragus that he wouldn't really consider them allies, at least not yet. Vegeta may not be a friend at this point, but he tells Paragus the prince isn't all that bad. Goku asks Paragus how he got here and who he's with, so Paragus fills him in. He calls for Broly, and out of the cave comes Broly. Paragus gets Broly to introduce himself, and Goku is amazed to see that not just one, but two other Saiyans are alive. And as for this Broly guy, he seems pretty strong. Around this time, I would place Broly around just under Goku's base form, since as we saw in the Broly movie, he did start out as a little bit lower than Vegeta but eventually worked his way up as he continued fighting. As we know, he grows in power exponentially as he continues fighting, so he will get more powerful as time progresses. But this amazes Goku nonetheless. This guy, who's basically suppressed right now, is nearly at the same strength as him. Paragus wants to know how Goku got here and if they can get off this planet, and Goku leads him to the ship, which he doesn't exactly know how to work. Paragus notices it's a Frieza ship, and while he is excited to see a way off, he's suspicious about how he got the ship, so he does ask Goku. Goku tells him he got the ship after defeating Frieza, and Namek blew up. And this shocks Paragus. How is it possible that another Saiyan could defeat Lord Frieza of all people? He's also concerned that King Cold probably wants to get revenge, so he informs Goku about King Cold's existence. While Goku isn't really scared of King Cold, Paragus tells him that they mustn't leave yet, out of fear of being found by King Cold and killed. Even during the journey back to Earth, they could be shot down in space and left to die by King Cold. Goku thinks it over a bit, and he does eventually agree to lay low for a while with them. This is a great opportunity for him, since there's nothing really to do on this planet, so Goku sees it as a perfect opportunity to train. He asks if Paragus wants to spar with him, but Paragus knows Goku's far out of his league. However, he still wants to enact revenge on Vegeta with Broly, so this is also a great opportunity for him to strengthen his son. Paragus did mention in the movie that he trained with Broly, but of course his power was vastly lower, so at this point it wasn't helping Broly very much when they're training. Goku gets excited and he begins to ease Broly into training, as you can tell Broly is pretty inexperienced. As time progresses over the next few weeks and months, Goku and Broly train together continuously for most of the day. Since there's nothing better to do on this planet, and they do begin to bond, Broly is happy to have a new training partner and a potential new friend, and of course, Goku feels the same way. 
Broly is also grateful that Goku is teaching him all of these things, and he's having fun doing all this. This will bring out some major changes with Broly in the future. Broly will also learn to control his power a bit easier, but without having seen the full extent of it, Goku can't help him control his power and anger completely. But Broly does gain a little bit more control over time, and he learns to control his power and himself a little bit more each time they spar. Well, at least in his base form. Back on Earth, the Namekian Dragon Balls are gathered like usual to bring everyone back, and they do try to wish Goku back. Like the original, they find Goku is alive, but he doesn't want to be brought back just yet. He needs more time on this planet before he comes back, since he wants to make sure Broly is fully able to control his power when they eventually come back, and he obviously doesn't just want to leave Broly and Paragus there alone. He does want to get stronger himself too, and this harsh environment, coupled with the fact that the planet is pretty barren and there's no collateral damage to be had, this makes a perfect planet to train on. Him and Broly can pretty much go all out over here if they ever wanted. They continue to train without stopping for the next few months, and Goku eventually gets Broly to try and release his full power. Broly is scared to do so because he feels he'll lose control, but Goku says he's doing this to help him to not lose control in the future, and this is the only way to train it. He ends up getting Broly to transform into his wrathful form by fighting him, and Broly does end up losing control, with Goku trying his best to calm him down. Broly begins to beat on Goku, and while Goku takes this beating, he eventually powers up to Super Saiyan, and with a quick chop to the neck, he knocks out Broly before he can power up anymore. After all his training with Broly, he knows how easily Broly can power up and learn as he fights, so he knows he has to end this quickly before Broly's wrathful form would eventually overpower his Super Saiyan. As Broly falls down, Goku remarks to himself, This could take a while. While Paragus is glad that Goku is training Broly for him, he still doesn't completely trust Goku. Since he has ties with Vegeta, then he doesn't know if he should be this open to trusting him, but this is a win-win either way. If it turns out Vegeta isn't on Goku's home planet, then that's good for Paragus, since he could trust Goku by then. If Vegeta is there, well, Goku is basically bringing him right to his target. Either scenario is great for him, and it is eventually decided that it's finally time to head back to Earth, as they have laid low for long enough. The three Saiyans board the ship that Goku arrived in, and head to Earth. Coincidentally, at the same time, King Cold is also heading to Earth with his newly repaired son. More time passes, and everything on Earth remains pretty much the same, with the resurrections, the wishes, all that fun stuff. One day, everyone picks up two large powers that are heading right for Earth, so they go over to see what it is. One of them is Frieza, and they arrive to see someone that looks pretty similar to him, but a lot larger. It's Frieza and King Cold. They have arrived to enact their revenge. Alongside this, a young boy comes out of nowhere with a sword, and he's apparently a Super Saiyan. This is of course Trunks, and this encounter goes pretty much like normal, with Trunks killing the two. He greets everyone and throws down a capsule, containing a fridge with beverages. He says Goku should be here anytime now, and they should just wait here. However, Trunks senses something is wrong, when three powers are coming down to Earth in a large ship, rather than one power in a small pod. The ship lands itself, and Goku jumps out. Wow! Looks like we didn't need to worry about King Cold after all! And was that just Frieza I sensed too? As he walks out, two people are behind him, a mustached man with a tail, and a taller man with long black hair and scars. These two men are obviously Saiyans. Vegeta is taken aback by all that's going on. Another Super Saiyan has arrived, Kakarot is back, and now there's these two other Saiyans here? What, are they Super Saiyans as well? Vegeta scoffs and yells out at them. This catches the attention of Paragus, as he turns over and sees none other than Prince Vegeta standing there. A majority of viewers voted that instead of being an enemy or remaining neutral by attacking or waiting to attack respectively, Paragus would instead have his grudges eased by those around him and end up becoming an ally. However, he still is a Saiyan after all, and we're not going to completely change his personality and just make him like Goku. At the moment, he's in a rage to see Vegeta here, but he decides not to do anything. Goku told Paragus that Vegeta is a changed person from who he was before, and also knows that he's outnumbered here, and even with Broly, they'd be facing at least two different Super Saiyan. Besides, Broly probably wouldn't want to betray Goku by being forced to fight Vegeta, and being put under the stress of that scenario could easily cause Broly to rage out and just kill everyone for all Paragus knows. Paragus remains calm, for now, as he starts to rethink attacking Vegeta for his father's actions. Vegeta was only a baby at the time, and he probably knows nothing about it. Thus begins the process of Paragus beginning to accept that Vegeta wasn't really the one to blame here. Paragus greets Vegeta and tells him that he and his son are Saiyans who were sent off the planet by the king. Well, I hope you're not here to settle some old grudge against me. That's all on my father. 
This angers Paragus a bit, but it does get him to think again about Vegeta, because Vegeta is kind of right. Just like I said before, he's starting to realize that Vegeta's not really the one to blame here. And if King Vegeta never sent Broly away, then both Broly and Paragus would have died on planet Vegeta with everyone else. He introduces Broly, who is nervous, kind of like when he met Frieza in the movie. Goku jumps in to introduce Broly, and tells Vegeta that they've been training together and that Broly is intensely powerful. While all the introductions are going on, everyone is just watching in confusion, especially Trunks. King Cold and Frieza showed up like normal, and Goku did as well, but he didn't know who these two Saiyans were. Everything in this timeline seems pretty normal though, so he goes along with it, even though he's never heard of these two before from his mother. Trunks asks Goku if he could talk to him alone, and pulls him to the side to inform him about who he is and why he's here, just like normal, with Piccolo hearing everything. Now that they're aware of the androids, it's time for the training to begin. As basically Vegeta's subjects, Broly and Paragus are given rooms at Capsule Corp for the time being, and they get a new change of clothes as well. Sadly, I'm not a good enough artist to draw them in entirely new outfits, so let's just say the clothing that they have is the same as the ones that they get in the movie after meeting Frieza, just for the time being. I'm also going to take a liberty here and say Paragus still has both his eyes and that he didn't lose it yet on Vampa. This isn't really that big of a deal, but I just kind of wanted to point that out. During the three year training period, Paragus would eventually begin to train again on his own, since he wants to at least have a chance of protecting himself from those supposed androids if he ever needs to. Broly of course would train with Goku, and be introduced to Gohan as well. Since they have similar natures, being both shy and kind of passive, I feel Gohan and Broly would come to like each other, kinda like Piccolo, but with Broly being much more open to showing his friendliness and being kinda like an uncle to him after the training period. Over this time, Broly is able to master his wrathful form, and Goku is able to become stronger as well, alongside Gohan. Goku is interested in this power Broly has, and wonders if he or Gohan could do it as well. While Goku himself has no use for the power because of Super Saiyan and Kaioken, Gohan might be able to benefit from this power boosting form, since he doesn't have Kaioken or Super Saiyan himself. He gets Broly to train with Gohan and attempts to get him to teach the new form that he now has mastery of. Gohan does have insane rage boosts after all, and his part Saiyan is turned into a grade 8 before, so Broly is able to teach him about the form from what he knows about it, despite not being too good of a teacher. This training between them strengthens their bond even further even though Gohan can't quite access the form yet, but he has a basic understanding of it. Since they live together, Broly also does some training with Vegeta from time to time as he lives at Capsule Corp, and he can handle the gravity room pretty easily. Broly also doesn't learn Super Saiyan just yet, mainly due to himself holding back immensely because he doesn't want that power to take control of him and make him go berserk again, because unlike his wrathful form, a berserk Super Saiyan more powerful than Goku or Vegeta would be probably impossible to stop especially when you take into consideration how much more powerful Broly has gotten. For now, his wrathful form is fine until he gets something that pushes him to become a Super Saiyan. Paragus has become stronger, but isn't as interested in fighting as the others are at first, since he would be pretty weak in comparison. However, since he still has his tail, Paragus has been training to get his Great Ape form under control, so he could use it in battle if needed. From doing this, he begins to train more and more and gets adjusted to it, and eventually he begins to like it more, just like any Saiyan would. He eventually begins to train with the humans in his great ape form in order to exploit some Zenkai's to boost his power further, which benefits both him and those he's training with. By being with Krillin, he's also able to pick up a few techniques. He's not strong enough to train with the Saiyans yet, but this is good enough for now. As for his grudge against Vegeta, it takes some time, but it goes away. At first he was just hesitant, but he realizes now that he should just leave it in the past, especially because he doesn't see any point to blame Vegeta anymore. He could justify it as Vegeta paying for the sins of his father like he does in the movie, but all this time thinking has made him realize that it's foolish reason to go after him. The king is dead, and the prince didn't have anything to do with this directly, so he does let it go over time. The three years pass, and the day of the android's arrival is here. Everyone arrives to the location that Trunks gave, and they go into the city to find the androids, this time with Broly and Paragus helping. Before Android 20 encounters Yamcha, Paragus is jumped by 19, and begins to have his energy drained. Broly sees this and gets enraged, instantly going into his wrathful form and rushing over. Even though he's angry, he's learned to control his power and his anger over the three years, and is able to think clearly. He flies over and with one punch, he knocks 19's head clean off and blasts the remains of 19 into oblivion. In another part of the city, Dr. Jiro is about to strike Yamcha but is alerted by the blast he hears where 19 should be, and goes into hiding in a nearby alley. 
Jiro now is going to bide for time and try to wait out as everyone searches for him and Paragus is given a Senzu to heal. Realizing how quickly his plan is beginning to fail, Jiro thinks it's time to escape. He flies out of the alley that he's hiding in and everyone chases after. During the chase, Goku is about to catch up to him but then clenches his chest in pain as he falls from the sky. The heart virus has finally struck and he has to be taken away to get the cure. Yamcha takes Goku back home as everyone continues chasing. This distraction was good enough for Jiro to slip away, blowing up some rocks to throw up dust as cover. At this time Trunks arrives. In the midst of Jiro's blast, Bulma's ship is also destroyed and the events here go pretty normal, with the identity of Jiro being revealed. As usual, Vegeta heads off on his own with Trunks pursuing him, and the others split up. Instead of Gohan leaving with Bulma, Yajirobe, and Baby Trunks, Tien decides to take them to Goku since Broly wants Gohan to stay with them in search. Krillin and Piccolo go off on their own as Broly, Paragus, and Gohan go together to try to find Jiro's lab. Jiro arrives at the lab first and awakens the androids with everyone in pursuit. As they awaken, everyone arrives and watches the androids kill Jiro and take the pod for Android 16. Trunks tries to blast the androids like he did originally, but all this really accomplishes is destroying the lab. 16 is awoken and the androids head off on their own in order to complete their mission of killing Goku. Trunks confirms that these androids are the ones from his timeline, and of course the natural response to this is everyone going after the androids. They eventually catch up with the androids and Vegeta attempts to fight, but he proceeds to be easily taken out by 18 as usual, with Trunks having the same outcome as well. They do fare a little bit better, given that Vegeta is a little stronger from the training, but he still gets knocked down nonetheless. Seventeen is up against Piccolo, Gohan, and Broly, with Paragus and Krillin watching from the sidelines as they feel powerless in the situation. The three of them attack Seventeen, having some great synergy in the attacks, as Gohan trained both with Piccolo and Broly in the past. Broly powers up into his wrathful state, but it's still not enough, even with a three on one. Seventeen is beginning to have fun despite overpowering the three. Every time he tries to hit Seventeen and misses, Broly gets more and more angry and grows stronger and stronger eventually landing some hits but not doing a lot of damage. Him growing stronger and stronger in the fight is pretty much the same as he does in the movie. Gohan remembers training with Broly to unlock this wrathful form and he tries to use it in this fight but can't quite access it yet. This is getting boring. Android 17 knocks Piccolo away into a mountain pretty easily and this sets Gohan off into a rage. Alongside Broly, he taps into the power of a great ape and explodes with anger, allowing him to finally access the wrathful form. They continue to fight 17, and with Broly's immense strength, and the fact that both Saiyans are growing more powerful as they fight, 17 begins to lose ground and is actually being hit quite a few times, taking a little bit of damage. He still outmatches them, but he realizes that they're getting stronger as they fight. Remember, Broly is insanely strong because of the 3 year training, and even without Super Saiyan, it's safe to say all the experience he got and the fact that he grows as he fights means he's potentially the strongest here as far as everyone knows, which wouldn't be entirely out of the question given his progression in the movie, and this quote unquote fight giving him more power through frustration, and since he naturally grows as he fights. Gohan is also getting progressively angrier and more out of control, which is fine now in this fight but becomes an issue later. Well, we've had our fun. At this point, the androids head out since they're worried that if anyone ganged up on them all at once, they might actually have a tough time. 18 of course kisses Krillin before they leave, with Paragus watching in horror scared that she might just obliterate him on the spot. Krillin feeds everyone a senzu bean, but Gohan seems a little different. He's still in his wrathful form that he just unlocked. Though he trained with Broly to try to use this form, he's never actually used it until now, and Broly isn't exactly a good teacher. Considering he's never actually tried to use it before, Gohan doesn't have any control over his anger and begins to rage out. He catches Broly off guard and attacks him, but with Broly knowing his power and how it works, he powers up as well. Similar to what Goku did to him on Vampa in the last part, he just powers up to full power, quickly knocking Gohan out with one powerful strike, making sure not to hurt him too bad. Gohan has this new power, and like Broly in the past, they need to train him to keep his anger under control in case he rages out in the future and becomes completely uncontrollable. After the encounter with the android, Piccolo flies off to the lookout to convince Kami to merge with him. Gohan and Broly on the other hand, go off with Trunks as Bulma has just informed them that another time machine was just found nearby. The next bits of this arc go pretty normally, Piccolo and Kami merge and Piccolo meets the creature known as Cell. Like Trunks, we're gonna keep Cell's timeline the same as it is in canon so he doesn't actually have Broly's DNA. The rest continues as normal except Broly and Paragus are present, which doesn't change much about Cell either. 
Trunks and Krillin go back to Jiro's lab like usual, Bulma tries to analyze the blueprints for the androids, and Goku finally is recovered. Here, things begin to change slightly. Goku tells everyone about the hyperbolic time chamber and wants to take everyone there, but he can't instant transmission there, so the journey takes a little bit, but they still get to go there. The first to go in are Vegeta and Trunks. The other Saiyans outside train in the meantime. We begin to see a lot more changes here, and they're pretty drastic. The fight with Piccolo and 17 goes pretty much the same, with Cell defeating Piccolo, absorbing 17 and becoming semi-perfect, and Tien ends up blasting Cell with a tri-beam to allow 18 and 16 to escape. Goku and everyone on the lookout sense this going on, but they know they'll die if they go down there. Originally, Goku saved Piccolo and Tien by using instant transmission, but we know in this scenario, Goku never went to Yardrat. He doesn't have instant transmission, so this is the biggest downside to the story, because by changing Goku's destination, he doesn't have one of his most iconic techniques, which is a big problem. Without instant transmission, he can't save both Piccolo and Tien. Because of this, they end up being left there to bleed out and die, as Cell heads off. Gohan senses Piccolo dying, and Goku tries to stop Gohan from going down there, but they both end up going anyways. With two Senzus in hand, Gohan flies as fast as he can, with Goku, Broly, and Paragus chasing after him. He arrives first and finds Tien, who is barely alive, and he gives him a Senzu bean. Tien was on the brink of death, but is actually able to survive now, just barely. Gohan is desperately trying to search for Piccolo, as his energy fades into nothingness. Suddenly, it disappears completely. Gohan frantically looks around, and then fixates on something on the shoreline. It's Piccolo. A hysteric Gohan goes to Piccolo, desperately trying to wake him up. This is nearly the same as Trunks and future Gohan, if you remember how that went. Gohan realizes that Piccolo is dead, and he lets out a primal scream of sorrow and rage at the sight of Piccolo's death. His power rises immensely, even surpassing that of Goku and Broly at this point. A bright flash of light fills the area. The dust settles, and the three Saiyans and Tien see in front of them that Gohan has changed. Gohan has just went Super Saiyan from the loss of Piccolo. The four of them go over to console Gohan and try to calm him down, and they tell him they need to go back to the lookout right now. Gohan lets go of Piccolo's corpse, and he drops back into his base form and he passes out, both from shock and exhaustion from transforming into a Super Saiyan. The mood is solemn. Piccolo is dead, and while the Dragon Balls are gone before when he merged with Kami, they're now gone completely, and they don't see any way of being able to get them back with no Piccolo. At least for the time being. And Gohan had to witness the death of his best friend, and he couldn't do anything about it, and he's now a Super Saiyan. With no word spoken, Goku picks up Gohan, and the group heads back to the lookout. Tien feels pretty remorseful that he was the one to survive, and it meant Piccolo died, since he was found first as sort of a survivor's guilt, but Goku assures him not to feel bad. There is nothing that could be done, and it's good that they were able to at least save one friend. We arrive back at the lookout to find Vegeta and Trunks exiting the time chamber as they head off to fight Cell. Now it's time to see who goes in next. On my last video, the majority of you voted that they wanted to see Broly go in the time chamber with Goku, his teacher, so the next two people to go in the time chamber are naturally Goku and Broly. This time is also spent training their current power, with Goku trying to teach Broly Super Saiyan as well. Even if Broly goes berserk, it's worth a shot, because there's no Dragon Balls, no second chances, so they need all the power they can get. Gohan is also in a pretty bad mood right now, obviously. First, he loses Piccolo. Now he feels kind of neglected by both his father and his new friend Broly, by the fact that Goku decided to go in the time chamber first with Broly instead of him. Remember, Gohan is only a kid still, and he's gonna act that way. Of course he'd get jealous from this. It makes him feel like he's too weak, and like he won't help at all with defeating Cell, even though he's a Super Saiyan now. This is where we see a change in Gohan's character for this arc. He begins to get more of a motivation to fight because of a combination of him wanting to prove himself, and for him wanting to prevent the loss of any more friends in the future. The encounter with Cell and Vegeta goes pretty normally. Cell searches for 18, he fights Vegeta and Trunks, and Krillin destroys the remote to kill 18. Cell absorbs 18, and we now have perfect Cell, just like normal. Gohan senses this power from the lookout and feels even more of a desire to become stronger now, seeing that Cell just became massively stronger. Cell killed Piccolo, and Gohan wants to be the one to end him. For Paragus, it's kind of the opposite. Paragus is beginning to feel left behind. He was weaker than everyone else already, but now he's really behind everyone. He feels useless, all of his training feels like it goes for nothing, when everyone else is now exponentially stronger than him. We'll see this come into play as well. Of course, with Cell becoming perfect, the events away from the lookout still go pretty much the same as normal, with Cell proposing the idea of the Cell games so everyone can get stronger so he could truly test his perfection. 
Android 16 is also taken to Capsule Corp to be fixed and reprogrammed like normal. The Cell games are announced, and a day passes as Goku and Broly exit the time chamber. Goku is able to teach Broly Super Saiyan, although Broly is in a very volatile state while in the form. He can control it partially, but not well, and is very prone to outbursts that make him berserk. But he's still able to somewhat transform on command, and for the days coming up to the Cell games, this training also means Goku never actually achieved Super Saiyan Grade 4 in the time chamber. Well, he didn't master it. He knows it exists, but since it was so difficult teaching Broly about Super Saiyan, Goku only had time to teach himself Grade 3, and rather than having full access to the perfected Super Saiyan form, Super Saiyan Grade 4, at best, he's just aware that it exists. After this, it's Gohan's turn to go in with Goku. In the time chamber, they both have a head start as opposed to normal. Goku already knows Super Saiyan Grade 3, and Gohan has Grade 1, but Goku knows he can go beyond Grade 3, and that is his new goal. Him and Gohan are easily able to reach Super Saiyan Grade 4, the mastered form, in less time because they also have a head start. Despite Goku being ahead, Gohan is still able to quickly catch up due to him already being a Super Saiyan and having the motivation to train. Knowing that Broly and Gohan are both more powerful now, Goku is feeling really confident about fighting Cell. And to avoid any further berserker moments, Goku also trains Gohan to fully master his wrathful form that we saw in the last part. With this training, Gohan can now easily use this form as if it were just his base form, kinda like Broly does. But for now, Gohan trains his Super Saiyan forms instead because during the extra time they have in the time chamber, it's better to train this because they're more powerful. But during this time, Goku discovers something. They're both getting stronger in this perfected Super Saiyan form, but one day, Gohan and Goku are training, and Gohan ends up powering up farther than Goku's ever witnessed before. His hair spikes up even further and electricity appears around him before he drops out of the form. This of course is Super Saiyan 2. Goku and Gohan continue to train to pursue this form and end up leaving the time chamber soon after. Goku himself wasn't able to access Super Saiyan 2, but given their head start and Gohan's motivation to train, Gohan is actually able to kind of use it now off the bat, but he does require some effort to actually turn into it and he can't completely do it at will. At best, he just knows of its existence, and he has a little bit of experience with it. And of course, as we know, people can only enter the time chamber twice in their lives before Dende fixed it. And of course, this would mean Goku couldn't go back in with Gohan, because he already went in once during Dragon Ball. But the way I'm going to get around this is kind of stupid, but we're going to say that since Goku was only in there for one month in the original Dragon Ball, we're just gonna say he can only go in 11 months this time and it adds up to two years and that counts as him going in twice in his lifetime. Kind of a cop out, but it's a good way to help this story continue the way it is. And they got a head start on their training anyways, so leaving a month early doesn't really matter too much to them. Vegeta and Trunks are about to head into the time chamber, but Paragus perks up and asks if he can join them. The three of them can go in at once, but it just means that there's gonna be a less of a food supply because there's only enough food to supply two people for a year. Obviously, Vegeta isn't too enthusiastic about this since Paragus is pretty weak, but this could be interesting for him to train Paragus and have another strong Saiyan on their side. This means since there's less food, they go in for less amount of time, but since Paragus is there, it's a third person, so the training gets more effective between the three of them. Time passes and the day has finally come. The Cell Games begin. Everyone, including a newly empowered Paragus and Vegeta, head to the site of the Cell Games, with some new tricks. You two aren't the only ones who've mastered Super Saiyan, Kakarot. Vegeta powers up to Super Saiyan Grade 4, just like Goku, having mastered it in the time chamber. Both him and Trunks now have access to the mastered Super Saiyan form. Our training has been pretty fruitful. Go and show the rest what you've learned, Paragus. Paragus, in response, begins to power up. The weakest of the Saiyans ends up surprising everyone now. For the first time, Paragus is a Super Saiyan as well. Vegeta didn't want to have a weak training partner, so he was able to whip Paragus into shape and get him to become a Super Saiyan, mainly so Vegeta could train more effectively. Given his feelings about being inadequate and his doubt in himself, Paragus was able to channel these emotions during this time alongside the rigorous training and allowed him to finally transform. He no longer has any need for his grade 8 form. The only thing is he's just a Super Saiyan grade 1, so it's not very efficient for him to use, but it's better than nothing. Now there are six Super Saiyans, with the humans and Android 16 there as well. Oh yeah, and Mr. Satan. Here's a list of all of their powers in order, with their best transformations beside them. Even with Broly and Gohan's immense power, remember, 
Broly is prone to going Berserk as a Super Saiyan still, and Gohan requires some effort to go Super Saiyan 2 at this point. The only real difference is that he has experience and knows it exists. With all this firepower, the Z Fighters are confident in their fight with Cell. First we have Cell vs Goku, which goes pretty normally. However, there's no instant transmission Kamehameha, for obvious reasons. The fight isn't really going anywhere, so Goku ends it and just lets someone else have a turn to go, and he turns to Broly. He knows Cell's strong, but Goku wants Broly to end this since Goku wants to get everything back to normal ASAP. No Senzu Bean this time. Goku has no sympathy for Cell because he killed Piccolo and nearly killed Tien. Broly begins to fight in his wrathful form, and is doing pretty well. He's in his wrathful form because he's afraid that if he goes Super Saiyan, he'll just go berserk and end up causing more damage than good. The few times he's ever gone Super Saiyan, he lost control, and he's barely ever come close to controlling it without exhausting himself. Cell keeps pushing him to power up more and more, and during the fight, he ends up stabbing Broly with his tail and draining some of his power. And as we know with Broly, a fraction of his power equates to a lot more power than if it were anyone else. Cell gets a huge power up, and Broly realizes if he wants to end this, he has one choice. He's back into a corner, and he finally powers up into his Super Saiyan. Shockwaves cause the entire area to tremble. The light from the transformation dissipates, revealing Broly with golden hair and yellow eyes like in his wrathful form. Surprising for Broly, he's not berserk. He's elated by this, and he's confident now. He smirks as he rushes towards the empowered Cell with tremendous speed. With quick punches and kicks, Broly overwhelms Cell and finishes him off with a blast from his mouth that seemingly vaporizes the android. With his confidence, Broly doesn't even use all of his power in the blast because the gap between Cell and him is so large. The dust settles and Cell is gone. Is it over? Everyone is glad to have defeated Cell, and pretty easily. Broly powers down, a little tired from controlling the form, but he has a newfound confidence. He no longer has a fear of turning Super Saiyan or going berserk, and he's happy that he was easily able to defeat Cell. Or so they think. Broly made one mistake with the way he finished off Cell. Like I said, he didn't use all of his power, and thought what he used was enough, and now he dropped his guard. In the distance, a shockwave and smoke, and electricity appears. A large red beam pierces through the smoke. The beam strikes the distracted Broly right in his chest, directly on his scar. This not only pierces through Broly completely, but reopens the scar. If the wound from the beam didn't do the job, the blood loss will. Broly falls to the ground, motionless. <laughs> It seems you forgot I could regenerate. The smoke clears, a newly empowered Cell standing there. Since Broly didn't use all of his power, Cell's core remained intact, and he came back more powerful than ever in his super perfect form. Catching Broly off guard allowed Cell to kill the Saiyan, much to everyone's surprise. You bastard! Paragus immediately powers up to his Super Saiyan and rushes towards Cell in a blind rage, only to be easily knocked into the ground unconscious with one hit from Cell. Goku begins to power up out of anger, but stops when he feels another energy rising. Gohan. First Piccolo, then Broly. Gohan mutters to himself, tears streaming down his face. His eyes turn blank and he lets out a loud scream of rage, with an explosion of power flowing through the area. Gohan is once again a Super Saiyan 2, but not like normal. Gohan's hair is even more defined, and his aura has a blue tint to it. Gohan has tapped into his rage and is in a new form. Super Saiyan Rage. Similar to what Trunks did in Dragon Ball Super using his rage and the power of Super Saiyan 2 to transform, Gohan has done the same. There's no real info on how this form is obtained other than intense rage and it's pretty similar to what Vegeta did against Beerus, but apparently it's its own thing. It's kinda ambiguous, but this transformation still kinda fits with the context of the situation and I think it's nice to include here. The combination of Gohan's intense anger in the past his massive potential and the power of Super Saiyan 2 work together to create this mutated power. With all of his power, Gohan rushes to Cell and lands a kick so hard that it takes Cell's arm off when he tries to block it casually. Cell is both surprised and furious. He regenerates the arm, but Gohan delivers a punch in the gut with such force that it temporarily paralyzes Cell by knocking the wind out of him, with Gohan following up with a flurry of punches that causes Cell to break into pieces. He regenerates again from this, losing more ki each time he regenerates. He considers blowing himself up, but with the overwhelming power and speed of Gohan's new form, he doesn't even have time to utilize an opening to do so. He grabs Cell by his legs and spins him around so fast that Cell becomes a blur. He flings the nearly unconscious Cell into the air. This is for Piccolo, Broly, and everyone you've killed! 
Gohan unleashes a Kamehameha larger than anyone's ever seen, even bigger than the solar or father-son Kamehameha in the original battle of Gohan vs. Cell. It flies far off into space and is hundreds, no, thousands of feet in diameter as it expands further out. The power is felt across the reaches of the galaxy by King Kai, his peers, and even the Namekians. Cell stands no chance. Within an instant, he's completely disintegrated and won't regenerate this time. Panting, Gohan powers down to descends to the ground, but not completely out of energy. The rage transformation is very draining to maintain after all. He lost two of his friends, but he won. He achieved his goal of avenging his friend Piccolo, and now Broly. The mood is bittersweet. While the present fighters are still shocked, even a little scared at the power of Gohan that he just showed, they're still proud and they celebrate the defeat of Cell, with Paragus staying behind for a bit, after being healed with a Senzu. Not even his new Super Saiyan form was enough to defeat Cell, and Broly still ended up dying. If anything, he feels like he got in the way. While Vegeta doesn't vow to stop fighting in this timeline, Paragus does instead. He snaps back to reality and flies off with the others. Now the objective is to revive Piccolo, Broly, and everyone killed by Cell. But there's no Dragon Balls. Even before Piccolo died, the Dragon Balls were gone. So Earth needs a new Guardian. Goku has no instant transmission, and he can't get to Namek now, but King Kai gets an idea. King Kai, even the Namekians too, they felt the power of what happened and they know the Earth is in peril. He contacts the Namekians and tells them what just happened, and how one of their own is dead. The Namekians realize their friend from Earth are in trouble, and they want to help. Everyone on Earth feels a sudden surge of power from two sources. Gohan instantly recognizes what's happening and smiles. He senses both Broly and Piccolo are alive again. Broly's body was brought to the lookout before, and he comes to life first. He comes from around the corner to greet Paragus, Goku, and Gohan again. Piccolo, having been buried where he died, flies up to the lookout soon after with a smirk on his face. But there's a third wish, and knowing that the Earth still needs a guardian, Dende volunteers to do so, and a wish is made to teleport him to Earth. And thus, we have a happy conclusion of this arc. Piccolo and Broly are alive, Dende's the new guardian, and he makes a new set of Dragon Balls that are used to make two wishes, bring everyone back to life, and then Krillin butts in and makes a wish for the androids to have their bombs removed, now that they're alive again. And we all know why he did that. Now, as we know, we're moving into the Boo arc next, so let's get into the time skip. Over this time, some interesting things happen. Gohan continues to train since he has no reason to stop. Goku is alive and Broly is around, as well as his new brother Goten, so he has people around him who are eager to train and it kind of rubs off on him. He's able to fit this in with his schedule given that he has school and all, and his training leads him to becoming the great Saiyan man earlier on. This also means that he meets Videl earlier since she wants to find out his identity, and this means they end up actually dating earlier, so they're together about a year earlier than the original story. This means they also become Great Saiyan 1 and 2 earlier on, and Videl's actually training earlier with Gohan, so that'll be helpful for the tournament. As for Broly, he's been keeping up with his training. Instead of living at Capsule Corp, he and Paragus now have their own place in the city now, since they've been on Earth long enough now, and Bulma gave them a little bit of cash to help them begin their lives as members of Earth. While things are going well for Broly, Paragus is a different story. One key feature of the Saiyans is how they remain in their prime until they're around their 80s, and then they begin to age rapidly. The Broly movie takes place in age 780, and while we don't know Paragus' actual age, he's somewhere into his 80s by then, and he has been elderly for at least a few years. At this point in the story, we're at age 774, and with this and the fact that Paragus was born before age 700, Paragus is at the minimum around 75 years old by now I would say, if not a few years older. And his aging process has already begun. He may look the same by age 75, but he knows he's aging out of his prime, which is convenient since he gave up fighting anyways. He looks a little younger than he is, but with his rapid aging, his few grey hairs will eventually turn into a full grey hairstyle before we get to Battle of Gods when he's fully aged up. As he becomes elderly, he's just spending his time enjoying life on Earth since it's a lot more peaceful than Vampa. During this time as well, Goku kinda needed to make a little bit of money, as well as Broly, so they both took up farming. They're already together a lot anyways, so it only makes sense that they're gonna be working together on the farm. As for the training however, Broly's training consists of him with Goku and Vegeta, or with Gohan and Piccolo, and occasionally Videl and Goten. As of now, their growth and power has been very noticeable. Broly is the strongest of the group, with Gohan close behind. Broly has Super Saiyan Grade 4 now, like Goku did in the Cell Saga, so he no longer has to worry about going berserk and he has full control of this form and he won't lose any energy from it. Gohan obviously has Super Saiyan 2, and he's able to get a lot stronger when he's in Rage and become Super Saiyan Rage, but that's not a form he has on command. 
Goku and Vegeta both have Super Saiyan 2 now, and they're stronger than in canon, but Goku doesn't have Super Saiyan 3 because he doesn't have that stamina that he has in the afterlife, not to mention that he hasn't actually accessed it, so he may not even know it exists. And another thing I'd like to mention, Android 16 is present. He never died in the last part, so he spends part of his life hanging out with the Sun family as kind of a new friend for Goten. The reason he's here a lot is because of his love for nature, and the area that Goku lives in is a perfect place for him. Alongside this, he occasionally visits his brother Android 17 on this island to help him protect the nature there. It might not seem like much, but this means that everyone has a connection with 17 now instead of him just being isolated, because 16 is that little bit of a link between them, and it may not seem important now, but it comes into play a bit later in the story. Since there's a new tournament coming up, everyone wants to join, including Broly and another new member. Given that everyone has a somewhat decent connection with 17 now, 18 actually reaches out to him and asks him to join the tournament. 16 won't enter the tournament because he's not human and he doesn't want to, and he offers to protect the island for 17 in place of him. Since 17 trusts him with that, he accepts this and he joins the tournament alongside his sister and the others. That tournament money could be useful for him since it'll let him take that cruise that he wanted, either alone or with his wife, we don't actually know when he got married, but I'd, I'd assume he'd want to take a cruise about this point. So with this new member recruited, everyone signs up for the tournament. The roster is pretty much the same, except some of the characters don't make it into the tournament. That being Pintar, who's pretty unimportant, and Goten and Trunks not joining as Mighty Mask, since they pretty much know that they'll be recognized since everyone else in the tournament basically knows them, except for a few people. But they're pretty much fine with the junior division for now. First is Krillin vs Broly. Oh, poor Krillin. Broly wins pretty easily. Next, Piccolo vs Shin, with Piccolo forfeiting like usual. Then, Videl vs Spopovich, and the result is... Videl wins! Well, she met Gohan early on and has a better mastery of ki and more power, and is able to hold her own against Spopovich better, not by much, but just enough to hold her own. But it's not as happy as it sounds. Angered that he got knocked out so early on and this pretty much ruins his plan, he jumps back into the ring and attacks her so he can complete his mission, much to the horror of everyone watching. His goal is to beat her down, to tempt Gohan to attack so he can drain power from him with his help from Yamu. That's a bad idea. Instantly, this causes Gohan to get enraged to the point he goes Super Saiyan Rage again. And since their match is over, nothing holds him back this time. It's completely in defense of Videl so he's justified in doing so. And this is overkill. A normal punch in this form alone is pretty much enough to incapacitate Spopovich completely, and Gohan knocks him unconscious without everyone even seeing this because of how fast it is. Yamu then rushes him to gather energy and stabs Gohan on the side, and that's when the tournament attendees realize that they're under attack by these two. With his immense rage, Yamu is getting a lot of energy from Gohan, but Gohan quickly knocks Yamu into a nearby wall as well, then fires a small key blast destroying the device he was holding, alongside the energy gathered. He's lost a bit of energy and he's injured by having his side stabbed, but he powers back down and he takes the delegate of Senzu Bean, as well as one for himself. And with the events going differently here, Shin and Kabito actually reveal who they are earlier and why they're here. With Videl and Gohan cured, they both go with the rest of the group to find out what's going on. And while being informed about what's happening, Spopovich and Yamu get up and begin to escape, leading everyone to chase after them with Broly as a new member, and Videl being left behind because they don't want her getting involved in case she can get hurt. Gohan already knows these guys are monsters, and he doesn't want Videl getting hurt anymore. Now with all of these members forfeiting the tournament, it ends up turning to a battle royale like normal, only this time 17 is there and no Mighty Mask. Everyone follows Spopovich and Yamu, and spies on them as they talk to Bobbidi and Deborah, and end up getting killed for failing to obtain energy. Deborah then attacks and turns Krillin and Piccolo into stone and kills Kibito, with the rest of the group going to the spaceship to fight. Back at the tournament, Trunks wins the junior division like normal, with the battle royale winners being the two androids. Now, the two siblings are fighting to decide who's the victor, with Mr. Satan watching this whole fight scared senseless, as he sees how powerful these two are. Ultimately, the victor is 17, and he agrees to throw the tournament to Mr. Satan like his sister did, under the same conditions of him getting the money for a cruise ship on top of the prize money. Now let's head back to Bobbidi's spaceship. There are five people heading in this time, Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, Broly, and Shin. They enter the ship, and we start first with Vegeta against Pui Pui, and since Vegeta is actually stronger in this timeline, he still wins, but even more easily so than before. I mean, it was kind of easy for him before, but now it's just a piece of cake. Yakon is up next, on the second stage against Goku, where Goku ends up using the same tactic of creating light by transforming, 
which originally caused Yakon to explode, and it does the same thing this time. It's been a pretty easy two stages so far. Now, we go on to the third stage, where in the original timeline we saw Havoc begin, but it goes a lot differently this time. Gohan has been keeping up with his training unlike in the original story, not to mention he was stronger than before anyways. Now Gohan is facing Deborah, and he doesn't have any trouble this time. He starts in his wrathful form to test where Deborah is, and he's a little outmatched in this form, but he's just doing this to see where his power stands up against Deborah, and to have a little bit of fun. Next, he cranks it up to Super Saiyan, where he ends up matching up pretty well against Deborah, who is actually having a tough time now that Gohan has transformed again. Gohan is having a lot of fun with this since he could actually test his new power against Deborah and have no consequences because of it. But he wants to defeat Deborah quickly so they can reverse his statue effects, so he ends up eventually going to Super Saiyan 2, and with this transformation, he's easily able to kill Deborah. And yes, I said kill. It may not seem like something Gohan would do, but he knows that he needs to do this in order to save Krillin and Piccolo so they aren't statues anymore. And Bobbity has been watching this whole time and is getting pretty worried. Gohan winning against Deborah pretty easily means Vegeta isn't frustrated, and Bobbity doesn't notice him as a potential target for possession at first. Now with his minions dead, combined with the fact that he didn't get enough energy before because of the failure of his minions, he thinks he could possess one of these fighters to get energy out of the battles between them. He looks into their minds and sees two potential candidates. He senses Vegeta's Saiyan side and desires, but they aren't as strong in this timeline due to Goku being alive and Vegeta already being content with fighting him, so it may be tough to make him budge. The other target is Broly. By looking into Broly's mind, he's able to sense Broly's hidden rage and the fact that he has a fear to go berserk. The same thing here though, Bobbity would have a tough time possessing him since Broly doesn't have really any evil intentions that Bobbity could manipulate to his advantage. And even if he does exploit his rage somehow, Broly has a ton of power and he may turn berserk against Bobbity, which will just end up getting him killed in the process. So now with these two choices, let's leave it up to a poll. Who does Bobbity possess, if anyone? Bobbity was either going to try and possess Broly or Vegeta, but realized he'd have trouble no matter who he tried to possess, or that it just might not work at all for either of them. He was not only running out of time, but Deborah was dead, and now he would be hunted down by the Saiyans, Shin, as well as Krillin and Piccolo who are no longer statues. So in a desperate attempt, he sees Vegeta as his best option and tries to control him. But on the last part, an overwhelming majority voted saying that Bobbity's possession wouldn't work this time. Goku is alive and Vegeta is pretty content with his life and has no desire to fight Goku all out. And with Goku's influence around, he also has no desire to actually go back to his Saiyan ways. Vegeta feels Bobbity trying to control him, and he easily brushes it off. He doesn't need to fall victim to that this time. Bobbity is fearful now, and he tries it on Broly, but Broly doesn't even react. Bobbity thought he could manipulate Broly's latent rage, but it doesn't work and he can't possess Broly at all. Eventually, Bobbity is found and he's quickly killed with little effort. All that remains is Boozag, which has only gotten a minute amount of energy from the fights in the spaceship. It's nowhere near close to hatching. Shin is able to take it far away and seal it for the time being, and informs everyone that he'll have Lord Beerus come and destroy it once he wakes up. No one knows who Beerus is at this point, except for Vegeta obviously, and this causes the group to actually find out about Beerus earlier on because of Shin's passing mention of him, and they find out about Beerus being the strongest guy in the universe at this point, as well as being the god of destruction and what that entails. As expected, this piques Goku's interest and he actually asks Shin to take him to Beerus to fight, but Shin instantly turns this down because not only is Beerus way out of his league, and not really the friendly type, but he can't wake Beerus from his nap. They'll just have to wait if they ever want to meet him. Now with all of that done, the Dragon Balls are gathered, and the only wish made that day is to bring Kibito back for Shin since he was the only good guy who died. I mean, yeah, we got Spopovich and Yamu, but I don't know if they'd even want to bring them back. And they're not really that important either way. No other wishes need to be made. The Boo arc basically doesn't even happen. No Boo, no Super Saiyan 3, no Majin Vegeta, Ultimate Gohan, Fusion of Patara, or Elder Kai. None of that. Without being able to possess anyone, Bobbidi's whole plan falls apart and the Boo arc stops before it even can begin. Remembering that Beerus is still around because of Shin gets Vegeta to realize he needs to train more if he ever wants to not only surpass Kakarot, but also defend against Beerus if he ever should need to. In his training with Goku, Goku is tapped into a power above Super Saiyan 2, which he calls Super Saiyan 3, but Vegeta sees it as useless because of how draining it is on stamina. He begins to ponder that Uzawa form that Broly and Gohan have, the Wrathful form, it might be useful if he can combine it with Super Saiyan somehow. He already had mastery over the Great Ape form, so maybe he can master the Wrathful form as well and improve it. 
While Goku pursues this new Super Saiyan 3 form and tries to perfect it in order to preserve his energy, Vegeta begins to experiment with something different. On the other hand, we have Gohan, who continues his training, but now that he's getting busier and busier, he tries to mix it in with his schedule. He doesn't fall behind on training, but he just trains a little less. Broly also starts to train a little less given this new period of peace, but he's still able to train a fair amount. He doesn't really have any need to though, so that's why he just stopped because he doesn't really care that much about fighting like Goku and Vegeta did. Over this time skip, here's what the power levels will look like. Goku and Vegeta are pretty equal at Super Saiyan 2, with Goku at Super Saiyan 3 obviously being stronger than both of those. Because of all the training he's done in the story and how powerful he's gotten, Gohan at Super Saiyan 2 is actually a little bit stronger than Goku at Super Saiyan 3. And of course above him is Broly who's now mastered Super Saiyan, and that form alone surprisingly is stronger than Gohan which is insane to think about, but it makes sense considering that it's Broly who's using it. Eventually, we arrive at the Battle of God's Ark. Beerus awakens and visits King Kai in order to fight Goku, who is a little weaker with Super Saiyan 3 than he is in canon, but not by a considerable amount. Beerus is about to head to Earth to find the other Saiyans because he finally wants to find the Super Saiyan God that he's been dreaming of. And funnily enough, in this timeline, Goku isn't the strongest of the Saiyans, he's actually one of the weakest. He only recently discovered Super Saiyan 3 instead of getting the jump on it before Boo, and without being in the afterlife with all that extra energy, he missed out on the large potential boost of power that comes with the form, because he discovered it later and he doesn't know how to utilize it as well. Beerus arrives to the party, and he has a pretty fun time. Just like in my what if about Gohan training after the Boo Saga, there's no Boo alive this time, so there's no nonsense with him in the pudding. While Whis and Beerus enjoy themselves, Beerus remembers why he's here, which gets Vegeta kinda shaken up about seeing Lord Beerus want to fight, but he feels very confident for some reason. Goku arrives on Earth, and he doesn't watch from afar this time, he actually makes it known that he's there. Beerus gets ready to fight everyone. First, Vegeta goes into his new wrathful form that he's been practicing, and fights Beerus, and it's obviously pretty weak in comparison, and he cranks it all the way up to Super Saiyan 2. The result is the same for him like it was with Goku, he doesn't really do anything with this. Gohan is up next, and he goes Super Saiyan 2 right away, and Beerus is surprised at how powerful he is with that same form. Eventually, he even cranks it up to Super Saiyan Rage, and he puts up somewhat of a fight with it, but is easily defeated by Beerus even with the Rage boost that comes with Super Saiyan Rage. Next up is Broly, and this is where things get a little bit hairy. Broly is putting up the best fight out of all of the Saiyans, even better than Gohan in Super Saiyan Rage, but he begins to get pushed back easily by Beerus, and he fights harder. He gets knocked down once and gets back up, getting weaker by using all of his stamina and getting frustrated. The cycle repeats until Broly is at his limit, and Beerus is about to knock him out for good, getting tired of this fight, but Broly begins screaming and Goku is immediately fearful. He remembers back to when he met Broly on Vampa, and when he suppressed Broly's rage when they first met, but it's crept back up into Broly, who's now beginning to power up. His hair begins to shift from the golden color that it has now, to a sort of greenish color. His eyes begin to go blank as he loses control for the first time, and he goes full power as a Super Saiyan full power, or legendary Super Saiyan, whatever you want to call it, I, I don't know, they keep switching up the names on it. He's able to knock Beerus back and actually cause Beerus to put in more effort, and Beerus actually begins to get entertained. Remember, Broly isn't as strong as he was in his movie, because this is way before, but at this point we'll say he gets Beerus to use about 25% of his power. However, this doesn't last and Beerus is still able to knock him out. Being disappointed that he hasn't found a true foe, he seems a little irritated, but then Vegeta gets his attention. Vegeta wants to test something out that he's been hiding, something that he worked on while Goku has tried to use Super Saiyan 3. He goes back into his wrathful form, with Beerus unimpressed as he fought Vegeta easily in the stage before. Vegeta smirks, and his power begins to rise. I can't believe I hadn't thought of this sooner, combining the power of two techniques into one. His hair flickers yellow, as Vegeta eventually ends up increasing in size, as if he's going to turn into a golden great ape, since he's combining the power of a great ape with the power of Super Saiyan, and I'm sure by now you already know where I'm going with this. Before he actually increases in size to become the great ape, he shrinks back down to his regular height, and is coated in a golden aura. The aura clears, and Vegeta is revealed there, looking completely unrecognizable. He has those same yellow eyes that he did in his wrathful form, but other than that he looks completely different. His hair is longer, he has a tail again, he has red fur, this is something no one has seen before. Vegeta obviously has become a Super Saiyan 4, but in this scenario, we're gonna call it Wrathful Super Saiyan. He calls it this because he considers it a different route from the numbered Super Saiyan variants, so he doesn't just call it Super Saiyan 4, I mean it doesn't really make sense in this case. 
but for us, we know it's Super Saiyan 4. His power at this point is comparable to Broly's when he went full power, yet Vegeta hasn't even powered up yet, and he has this power under control and begins to raise his key in order to fight Beerus. The two have a lot of fun with this fight, with Beerus exerting as much power as he did with Broly, but faltering a bit because Vegeta is more skilled and he keeps powering up, and he's more controlled than Broly. But even with this brand new form, it doesn't really end up working that well. Vegeta is actually surprised at how powerful this is. I mean, the multipliers for the Super Saiyan forms have become kinda irrelevant now in Dragon Ball Super, and there's no real multiplier for Super Saiyan 4, but just for a measure of his power, the Great Ape form is a 10 times boost in power, and Super Saiyan is supposed to be 50 times. So if you add those two together, that's gonna be 500 times, and I'm sure it would be greater with the Super Saiyan 4 form. That's probably just what it would be at Golden Great Ape. I mean, obviously we don't know, but we could just speculate that it's somewhere around 500 times or greater, which is just an insane boost in power for him. But obviously, this doesn't really do much to Beerus. So they get back to the party, and Vegeta is done fighting, with Beerus pleased to see that he's actually so strong, but not enough to be a Super Saiyan God. Gohan suggests the idea of getting the Dragon Balls to see what to do to get Super Saiyan God, so they summon Shenron and find out how to do the ritual. They find out that they need six Saiyans, and they have no issue getting that. Videl doesn't even need to reveal that she's pregnant. They have Goku, Gohan, Goten, Trunks, Vegeta, and Broly already there. And Paragus is actually there as well, so they have more Saiyans than they need. But the question here is, who do they actually give the form to? The first option is Goku, but he's technically the weakest here, so why would they give it to the weakest one? Vegeta is the strongest when he's Super Saiyan 4, but otherwise he's around the same level as Goku, and they don't know how the God form will affect the power, so it might not make any difference at all. And Gohan is both powerful and he has a lot of control, but he's a half Saiyan, so they're worried that the ritual won't work and they're hesitant to try it on him. And of course, Broly is an option, but since he's prone to going berserk after they saw what he did with the full power Super Saiyan, they're really hesitant on giving him a new power. Not to mention, he has only just mastered Super Saiyan a few years ago and he hasn't even gotten Super Saiyan 2. Not to mention he's lost stamina from his fight with Beerus. If they did give him a god form and he didn't end up going berserk, he might not even be able to control it. He is the strongest pure Saiyan one in base form, but it's very risky to give him the power in case he rages out again, or he simply can't control it and it just kills him somehow. Goku, Vegeta, Gohan, Broly, Goten, and Trunks gather together and prepare, and they don't know who to channel the power into. The options on the poll were Broly, Vegeta, Gohan, and Goku, and surprisingly, Goku won by a decent amount of votes. Considering he got the form originally, I honestly expected him to have the least amount of votes since it's something we've seen before. But it's nice to see you guys are keeping me on my toes with your unique suggestions, because you guys had a reasoning behind this. A lot of you wanted to say that Goku got the form because Goku was the weakest of the main Saiyans, other than Paragus and the kids of course, but you guys wanted to see him get ahead, and this form was the perfect way to do that. Vegeta has his new form, Gohan was strong already, and Broly was already way powerful, but didn't have control over it, so he wouldn't really have the control needed to have the Super Saiyan God form. And with all of those suggestions in mind, Seems like Goku was the majority's choice. Goku was also able to master the other forms easily, primarily Super Saiyan 1, so maybe he'll be able to do the same with this new power. Alongside that, he is the weakest of the group, and doing this would give him a nice boost in power and catch him up to everyone else. The group gathers together to decide who gets the form. They realize Broly's strong but he lacks control, and Gohan is strong and has control, but the group fears it might not work on him since he's only a half Saiyan and they don't want to risk it in case it angers Beerus that they can't unlock the form on the first try. And then there's Vegeta, but he'd rather focus on controlling this new form instead of being handed a new one that he'd have to juggle with. There's no pride in that. He'd rather earn the form on his own instead of having it handed to him by some ritual. Besides, how powerful can this new form be? More powerful than Wrathful Super Saiyan? He doubts it. He suggests instead that they give it to Goku so he can catch up with the group in terms of power, and the group agrees. Vegeta, Gohan, Broly, Goten, and Trunks form a circle and channel their energy into Goku. Minor point, but Videl doesn't have to reveal that she's pregnant because they have enough Saiyans. Actually, more than enough. Goku is lifted into the air as his energy soars, and he descends back down looking pretty much the same, except his eyes and hair are a pinkish red color now. However, what he lacks for in his change in appearance, he makes up for in his change in power. Goku is far beyond everyone else now, even where Broly was moments ago with full power, or Vegeta with Wrathful Super Saiyan. Beerus and Whis are definitely able to tell that this is, indeed, the Super Saiyan God form that Beerus dreamt of, and the fight between Beerus and Goku commences. It goes pretty similarly to normal, except this time, Beerus didn't promise to destroy the planet, 
since there's no boo around this time, and it goes a lot more smoothly than the original. To be honest, there's nothing really to cover here since it ends pretty much like the movie itself. After this, we have some time in between the Battle of God's Ark and Resurrection F, with Goku and Vegeta training on Beerus' planet, alongside Broly being there as well. Occasionally, Gohan does come to visit as well, since Broly's encouragement and his whole childhood being changed basically gives him motivation to train this time around, but unlike the other three Saiyans, he's not going to be there 24-7. Vegeta is there to unlock Super Saiyan God for himself, as well as training to perfect the new wrathful Super Saiyan form he showed off in the last part. While he didn't want to be handed the Super Saiyan God form, he still does want to achieve it, but by his own means, not just some ritual. Even though his wrathful Super Saiyan form is powerful, he never expected how powerful Super Saiyan God actually was and how far above it it is, and he wants to pursue that now. Broly on the other hand is there mainly because of Whis's interest in him. Whis was interested in the power Broly showed on Earth, as he became way stronger than he was in his base form, but he had no way to control it. He learns of Broly's other forms and how training with people like Goku helped him to control Super Saiyan and his wrathful form, but now Broly's actually scared to become a Super Saiyan again. If you remember back to when we reached the Cell Saga in this scenario, Broly actually did learn how to become a Super Saiyan, but was nervous to use the form since he was scared of losing control like he did in the Time Chamber. He ended up facing his fears against Cell, and he was able to actually control Super Saiyan, but after his fight with Beerus, he realizes that he may have not been able to control it as well as he thought. When you think back, the only time Broly has been under stress in this scenario, or in a perilous situation, was when fighting Cell. In the Boo Saga, or the fraction of it that happened, the only real threat was Deborah, who was weak in comparison, and he wasn't even up against Broly. It was pretty peaceful since Cell, and Beerus was the only one who actually pushed Broly to use more power, which made him lose control and go full power for once. Whis knows this now and wants to actually train Broly to control this power, as well as make him stronger in general. He might not be ready for the calming power of Super Saiyan God yet, but he can definitely control what he has currently and build upon that. So while Goku and Vegeta train to surpass Super Saiyan God, the only true goal for Broly now is to actually go Super Saiyan 2, so he could further control his power to Super Saiyan, and then probably ease into his full power. Gohan is in the same situation he was from my what if about him training after Boo. He only visits occasionally since he's still a pretty busy guy, but he gets some decent training in when he visits this planet. He does unlock Super Saiyan God, and since he was the first to use Super Saiyan 2 as well as being the most proficient with it, he helps Broly unlock Super Saiyan 2 for himself. Meanwhile, the remains of the Frieza Force end up going to Earth to gather the Dragon Balls and do some recon. They want to revive Frieza. They eventually do that and they bring him back to full health. It was pretty simple, Frieza's now back and he's ready to exact his revenge. And the Frieza Force fills him in on the intel they have. There are four Saiyans on Earth, with a few hybrid Saiyans as well. Two are obviously Goku and Vegeta, and the other one is an elderly Saiyan who doesn't seem like much trouble. And then there is his son, but they couldn't really gather any data on him since he's been off planet. But knowing how weak his father is, they don't suspect Broly to be that big of a threat. As for the half Saiyans, two of them are kids and the other one is a professor now who doesn't seem to be training, at least not on Earth. And with no Majin Buu, there hasn't really been any showcase of the full power of the Saiyans on Earth recently other than Goku's fight with Beerus. So the Frieza Force is greatly underestimating all the Saiyans now. Frieza is delighted to hear this. All these monkeys in one place, and they're all weak. He's confident he can handle them with a little bit of that disgusting thing they call training. Like normal, he begins training and he gets his golden form, and then he proceeds to head to Earth thinking it's going to be some sort of cakewalk, but he's badly mistaken. He arrives on Earth to see what Z fighters are on the Earth waiting for him, and they fight off his army, and then he eventually goes off against Gohan first since he's the strongest one there at the moment. But given how strong Gohan is in the scenario, he only needs to be in base for now to fight Frieza in his final form, kind of like Goku did in the original movie. Frieza is surprised that one of the Saiyans is this strong, and it's not Goku either, and he may have underestimated them. No worry though, he goes golden and he's able to get the upper hand on Gohan. Goku, Vegeta, and Broly then arrive, and meet up with Gohan, who's just toying with Frieza until they got here. He got a gauge of his power from the little bit of fighting that they did, and he knows this golden form would be some serious threat, but Frieza doesn't realize that they all have been training really well and have gotten new forms. This might be a good test for that new power they unlocked. It angers Frieza that they're not taking this seriously, but then that anger turns to fear as he watches the group collectively transform before him. This isn't really a fight for them, it's more of an opportunity for the group to show their power and actually test it out, since they all outclass Frieza at this point. Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta all power up, and all three of them actually turn into Super Saiyan Blue out of nowhere. 
And for those who have watched my what if about Gohan training after Boo, and how I said the situation here is similar for him, you may think it's odd that I'm giving Gohan Super Saiyan Blue in this what if, but not in that one. But an important distinction is that this time he doesn't have his ultimate form, so instead of like that what if where he's training to combine his god form with ultimate, he just jumped right to Super Saiyan Blue because he doesn't really have anything else to combine with Super Saiyan God. Broly, who has a god key already but not any god forms, instead powers up to a different form, and this form is Super Saiyan 2, although it looks different than what anyone would have expected. This version of Super Saiyan 2 kind of looks like what you'd get with Kefla or Kale, where it looks like a mix of legendary Super Saiyan and normal Super Saiyan 2. Broly has the same yellow eyes he had before, but he's surrounded with electricity now, he has green hair. He has his full power under control now, and he was able to turn it into his own version of Super Saiyan 2, giving him a massive leap in power compared to before, and allowing him to keep up with people like Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta in their normal god forms, and almost matching up with Super Saiyan Blue. The group wants to decide now who fights Frieza, with Broly being the one who ends up going. They do the normal game of rock, paper, scissors, and Broly wins, so he ends up being the one that wants to fight. He flies towards Frieza, who's now scared senseless seeing the size of this new Saiyan. Remember, Broly at full power was about 9 foot 10, nearly twice Frieza's size, so Frieza's definitely not going to underestimate him anymore. And this fight goes pretty poorly for Frieza, obviously. Broly beats on him pretty well, as Frieza becomes too tired to defend himself or fight back, even in his golden form. He prolongs it a bit before actually becoming tired, just because, you know, he's naturally durable. But Broly also grows stronger while fighting Frieza, and he reaches the point where Frieza's too tired to do anything, and Broly's too strong for Frieza to even handle. Not wanting to make the same mistake he did with Cell, he takes the opportunity and uses his full power to let out a blast from his mouth that kills Frieza. After what Cell did to Broly, when he didn't use his full power to kill him, Broly isn't taking any chances this time and wants to make sure he actually kills Frieza and doesn't give him a chance to do anything like, oh, I don't know, maybe blowing up the planet? It was kind of an underwhelming fight and a pretty uneventful arc, and the other three didn't really get to test their power at all, but Broly won for Rock, Paper, Scissors fair and square. While I do wish it was more eventful, I don't see this arc being really that impactful overall because of how powerful everyone is and how little of a threat Frieza would be. But really, this is just a showcase of what their training has actually done for them. But even though that might have been a bit of an underwhelming fight, we have the Universe 6 arc next. After killing Frieza, again, the Saiyans continue with their training, pretty much like before. It seems now that the power they got was worth obtaining, but they still have more to practice, especially Broly. Whis obviously wants to train them to use a certain other form, Ultra Instinct, but it's way too early for that now. They haven't even mastered Super Saiyan Blue yet, so we'd rather focus on getting them to master that. Broly, on the other hand, is focusing on honing his power more. Vegeta has also fully learned to master Wrathful Super Saiyan, to the point where it basically has no difference in stamina drain when compared to his regular mastered Super Saiyan form. This means he could use it as easily as his base form, instead of relying on normal Super Saiyan, which just makes Vegeta more powerful than he already was. And while he isn't going to be combining god forms like Super Saiyan God or Blue with it, the fact that Vegeta possesses god key and is now a godlike Saiyan in his base form just makes this form even more powerful. While it might not be on par with God or Blue, it's still very powerful and can be used without stamina drain, so it's useful for him. And after some time, the group eventually encounters Champa, which leads to the beginning of the Universe 6 tournament. There's no need for Manaka this time, so right now the team has three members, Goku, Vegeta, and Broly. They head back to Earth to recruit two more members. The first option is Gohan, who is reluctant to join because of schedule and conflicts, but is able to work around it eventually. Goku and Broly are counting on him to join, and he doesn't want to let them down, or Vegeta for that matter. For their fifth member, they're not too sure who to pick. Thinking that it's been a while since they fought together, Gohan suggests asking Piccolo to join. He is the next strongest person they could ask after all, and it would be nice to have him join them again. Piccolo obviously ends up agreeing to this, and he's happy to see Gohan is getting more motivated to train and fight, kinda like he was way back when. For the time being, they could head into the time chambers to prepare. Since they're not too sure how to allocate the time among an odd number of people, they're based on who requires the most training. They could have three people going at once, but the issue is that they won't have enough food for three, and it might make the training less effective. Goku and Vegeta head in for the first year and decide to train themselves to have stronger base forms and less stamina drain in their god forms. After a day passes, the two exit the time chamber, with Vegeta exiting in his wrathful Super Saiyan form for some reason, followed by Goku, who's also using the same form as well. During their time training, 
Doku got Vegeta to teach him how to use this form, which wasn't that hard to learn. But since they were looking to power up their other forms and lessen stamina drain, this gave Goku an idea. Kinda like he did with perfecting Super Saiyan, he wants to perfect Wrathful Super Saiyan to the point where there's minimal stamina drain, kinda like what Vegeta has now, but even further than that. Sure, the form might not be the strongest, but by doing this, it allows them to access the power from it with pretty much no stamina drain at all, and makes it as if they're just using their base forms. Not to mention that this form is actually empowered by God Key, since they already have that in whatever form they're using. However, I don't think they're going to combine Wrathful Super Saiyan with something like God or Blue. I just think that's kind of outlandish, since that would make stacking three techniques together, and it would create some transformation with an unholy design. I, I don't even want to imagine what that would look like. But enough of that. With two days left, they decide to rest and Gohan heads in first with Piccolo, then again for an extra day with Broly. Since he's been a little behind on training when compared to the other Saiyans, Gohan gets an extra day, which allows him to help train Piccolo and Broly. Broly further gets a grasp on God Key with this training, and has improved his version of Super Saiyan 2 even more. And after seeing what Goku and Vegeta did with Wrathful Super Saiyan, Gohan did want to see if Broly could attempt this, but decided it was too risky and could cause Broly to go berserk. Gohan himself could most likely use the form, but he decides to focus more on his God form since he fell a little behind with them, and he knows he can empower them further. Instead, he actually ends up mastering Super Saiyan Blue, which is the form from the manga that is basically an empowered version of Blue where the user can contain all of the aura. Goku and Vegeta mastered their form, so Gohan does the same but applies it to his most powerful form instead. Piccolo gets a huge boost from this training as well, and by constantly training with Gohan for a year, he's actually able to figure out how to use God Key like the Saiyans, and he gets it in his base form, so I guess this means he's a godlike Namekian now? I don't know, it just makes him more powerful. Now with the training done, the group heads to the tournament grounds. For the order of the fighters, I'll keep Goku, Piccolo, and Vegeta in their normal spots, with Gohan replacing Buu's spot and Broly replacing Tanaka. Goku's fight with Batamo is pretty much the same, but his fight with Frost goes a little bit different. Instead of fighting him as a Super Saiyan, he enters and fights in his wrathful Super Saiyan form since he's been maintaining this form ever since he got out of the time chamber, and he's been able to use it with little stamina drain. However, he still does lose to Frost because of his use of poison. But, he still did lower Frost's stamina more than he originally did. Piccolo is up next, and this time he's a little bit more suspicious of Frost. How could Frost end up taking down someone like Goku in the form he was using? He knows Frost isn't actually powerful enough to do that easily, so he might be up to something fishy. He also might be Universe 6's Frieza, so it's good to be wary of him. During the fight, something ends up catching Piccolo's eye. The needle on Frost's arm. He creates clones of himself and watches closely to confirm. When Frost attacks the clones, he can clearly see Frost maneuvering his arm in a way that gives him the ability to hit him with the needle. Piccolo ends up blasting him out of the ring easily, and then he tells the ref about the needle. Frost has been defeated by Piccolo, and has even been revealed to be a villain. Piccolo could have just told the ref that Frost was cheating, but this makes it more fun for him. It's more gratifying to get a legitimate win against him. Piccolo is up against Mageta next, and he's getting tired out by the heat from his attacks, but he's eventually able to figure out Mageta's weakness. However, Piccolo is exhausted from all the steam and the heat from Mageta, and concedes to let Vegeta head in next. Universe 6 is now down by 3 fighters, with Universe 7 down by 2. Vegeta's fight with Kaba goes pretty much like normal, with Vegeta powering down from Wrathful Super Saiyan for the first time since he entered the time chamber, in order to show Kaba his normal Super Saiyan form. He does end up teaching Kaba the form, and forms a little bond with him that he does have. The fight ends up going normally, and now Vegeta is against Hit. He eventually does have to go up to Super Saiyan in blue, but he loses either way against Hit. There's no way he can keep up. Gohan is now up against Hit, and he's able to do a lot better against him. From watching Hit's fight with Vegeta, Gohan is actually able to figure out how Hit's using his ability, and paces himself to match it. He guesses what Hit's doing, and Hit confirms this and tells Gohan about the ability. He hasn't remained in Super Saiyan Blue for the entire time like Goku and Vegeta did with Wrathful Super Saiyan, since he didn't want to give off his power right away. But he does realize that Hit is getting better the longer the match goes on, so Gohan decides he needs to end it. This ends up causing him to power up to Mastered Super Saiyan Blue, which surprises Goku and Vegeta and even Whis and Beerus. Gohan did basically get an extra two years of training after all, and while Goku and Vegeta were focused on one of their weaker forms, which ended up working for them since they basically have another base form now, 
Gohan instead decided to hone his most powerful form. And this doesn't mean that he can just use the form without stamina drain, it just means he's perfected the form to a point where he's using it at his max power. By going into this form, even with Hit's time skip, Gohan tires out Hit pretty well. But it's too late. Hit has already extended his time skip to a full second and is even going beyond that. He's able to take Gohan down, even with Master Super Saiyan Blue. This leaves Broly versus Hit, and the group is a little bit concerned. The good thing is, Hit is still very tired out because of Gohan, but he can still fight. Broly doesn't mess around and goes Super Saiyan 2 right from the start, and begins to realize that he won't win by fighting Hit hand to hand. Whenever he attacks, Hit already is ahead of him since he could easily dodge any punch or small blast, so he ends up keeping his distance right now. And this gives Broly an idea. He stands still and calms himself. Except for Gohan, no one knows what's going on. His aura begins to disappear, and his hair begins to settle down. Whis gets very happy because he knows what's happening now, something he's been waiting forever to train Broly to use. Broly has had access to God Key for quite a while, but never actually used Super Saiyan God. But when he was training with Gohan, he was able to actually use the form somewhat, and now has access to it at will. Broly looks completely different from his other transformations. Instead of being massive and bulky, he just looks like his normal self and calm. He begins doing better against Hit, but it's not enough. He's still concerned that even with this power, Hit can counter his attacks, but Broly has a plan. He rises up into the air and uses one of his most destructive moves, a Blaster Meteor. Hit might be able to counter some individual attacks, but there's no way he's going to be able to dodge or counter this. He can only hold it back or try to push it away. This creates an explosion of key and fires blast at random, and it's so unpredictable that Vados and Whis even have to protect the audience. The ring is completely destroyed, throwing smoke everywhere, and Hit withstands the individual blast for a bit, but the power from the actual explosion keeps expanding further and further with more blasts coming out. And with Broly's new power of Super Saiyan God, it's more than enough power to overwhelm Hit and get him off guard, then blast him off stage. Since he can't really use Super Saiyan God effectively yet, and that attack is pretty draining, Broly is now kind of tired out from it, but he's happy to have won. The tournament ends like normal, with Zeno appearing and the wish happening, and everyone returns back to their homes. And as you may expect, we're going to cover the future Trunks arc next time. Trunks is in his timeline fending off a shadowy figure. He isn't sure why this guy is back and attacking. He thought he's been dead for a while, and he doesn't know why he's attacking Trunks of all people. That's the most confusing thing to him. Maybe he's back to his old ways. Trunks has no time to think and prepares to escape, but then he sees something that deeply disturbs him. Future Bulma is grabbed and killed by none other than his own father, Vegeta. Trunks escapes and doesn't know what to think of this. Wait, Vegeta Black? Why did Zamasu steal Vegeta's body instead of Broly, Goku, or Gohan? But Trunks doesn't escape alone. He has a friend with him, someone that you guys already know. Let's talk about Vegeta Black. The explanation is simple, really. Zamasu stole Vegeta's body this time because he made some mistakes in his research. He saw Vegeta go blue first, and maintain it the best of anyone. Broly only has access to God, so Zamasu greatly underestimates him since he realizes it's a weaker form than blue. Not to mention, Broly couldn't even really control it that well. As for Gohan, who has the more powerful mastered Super Saiyan blue, and more power in general, Zamasu saw him struggling with that power without knowing that it was a different form of blue and was more powerful. He only saw that Gohan couldn't really handle it as well as Vegeta did with the regular blue. Besides, Zamasu is able to find out that Gohan is a half Saiyan, and he thinks he might not get the same benefits that someone like Vegeta would get from being a full Saiyan and getting Zenkais. He also thinks that's the reason Gohan couldn't control Super Saiyan Blue. Zamasu is obviously wrong, but he went with Vegeta nonetheless, which wasn't a particularly bad choice. We know how powerful Goku Black was even in his base form, so Vegeta Black will still be very strong. Now let's get into the actual story from where we left off. At Capsule Corp, Trunks' time machine appears out of nowhere and Bulma is the first to see it. When she sees what's inside the ship, she calls everyone over immediately. The Saiyans in our timeline arrive and they see a familiar face, Trunks, unconscious in the ship. But everyone, especially Broly and Paragus, are shocked to see that someone else is in the ship. Another Broly. A lot obviously happened with Trunks, so once the two of them wake up, they'll have to find out what went on. After some time, future Trunks and future Broly wake up and immediately jump back when they see Vegeta, 
until he realizes it's not Vegeta Black. Trunks calms down, but given that it's the first time he's time traveled, Future Broly is just as confused as everyone else. Trunks knows that he has some catching up to do with everyone since he saw them last time. Let's flash back a little bit to Trunks' timeline. After the defeat of Cell, Trunks obviously was able to go back and defeat 17, 18, and Cell from his own timeline. But one thing stuck with him from traveling into the past. If Broly and Paragus were alive on Vampa, then maybe he can go there as well and find them as some allies. It would require a lot of explaining, but seeing how Broly helped and performed against Cell, Trunks wants to help future Broly and Paragus and have them as allies. After the arrival and defeat of Boo in his timeline, Trunks realized that it was time to find an ally in case they face any future threats like this. With some astronomy and her knowledge of making ships like this, Bulma worked on a ship to travel to Vampa, and the two of them travel to the plant to meet the future versions of Paragus and Broly, which is pretty risky considering how Broly and Paragus originally acted. Unlike something like New Namek, Vampa wasn't something that was too hard to find, because unlike New Namek, it's not purposefully hiding like New Namek, it's just out there like any other planet would be. There's no date for when Bobbidi and Deborah arrived in the future, all we know is that it's sometime between age 788 and age 796. So when they get to Vampa, it's sometime within the 790s. Sadly, they arrive to only find Broly, who's still in his prime since he's a Saiyan. Of course, this is because Paragus is dead in this timeline from old age and having such poor living conditions. He's far surpassed his prime as a Saiyan, and he would have been 90 years or older at this point. Broly was left alone on Vampa for that whole time. Trunks was able to explain himself to Broly and gain his trust, and saved him from the planet and brought him to Earth. I mean, Broly didn't really have any other option, and going away from this planet was better. Broly only believed Trunks' time travel story because he's somewhat naive, and how else would Trunks know his name, location, and who his father is? That's the only real explanation that he could think of. With Broly on Earth, he's now happy to have a good planet to live on, and he began training with Trunks. But sadly, even after the defeat of Deborah and Bobbidi, Vegeta Black then arrived and we're now in where we began at this part. Taking that all in, the group is obviously going to help these two. Broly interacts with his future self, and it's odd to see the difference between the two. Future Broly is still very inexperienced with fighting and is not as powerful as he should be, despite training with Trunks. Trunks is never able to teach him how to go Super Saiyan, but Future Broly still has control over his wrathful form at the very least. Trunks is amazed to see how powerful everyone is now, while he was gone in his own timeline. While in the past, and waiting for the time machine to be refueled, the two of them train with the groups. Future Broly ends up training with Broly and Gohan so they could see if they can get him to unlock Super Saiyan, as those two would probably know it best. Broly knows himself better than anyone, and now that he knows how he can make himself control Super Saiyan, he and Gohan can help Future Broly while Trunks trains with Vegeta. Before training even starts though, the group gets another unexpected visitor, Vegeta Black. Beerus and Whis sense that he has immense godly key, and see he has a time ring and they feel that the key he has is familiar. This gets them thinking about who this guy actually is. Vegeta on the other hand is livid to see his imposter. Unlike Goku, he doesn't mess around. He instantly jumps in to fight him, and he powers up to blue right away, much to the shock of Vegeta Black. Vegeta Black's confident and smug look is wiped off his face right as Vegeta powers up in front of him. With one quick final flash, he fires it at Vegeta Black and, well, Vegeta Black dies. Yep, Vegeta goes all out and kills him out of anger. I know, some of you are probably wondering why I would even introduce him to kill him off that quickly. But think of how Vegeta is. Knowing Vegeta, imagine he saw someone that stole his body. Actually, scratch that, we don't even need to imagine. I never thought I'd reference the copy Vegeta saga, and it doesn't happen in this scenario because I'm not going to cover it, but we can just look at how Vegeta acted here. He was powerless and couldn't even fight, so that's why he didn't end up killing copy Vegeta, but he was set on actually taking him out for mimicking him. If Vegeta did have the ability to actually fight him at that point, he would have killed him right away. And I'm sure, especially after he heard what Vegeta Black did, killing his wife and what he did to his son's future, He's even angrier than he would have been against Copy Vegeta. So yeah, Vegeta doesn't even try to fight him and gauge his power like Goku did. He just goes full power and blasts Vegeta Black into oblivion. Huh, that was actually pretty easy. Trunks is amazed to see how easily Vegeta killed Vegeta Black after all the trouble he caused. Vegeta Black and base may have been powerful, but he still wouldn't compare to Vegeta Blue at this point. What a pathetic excuse for an imposter. 
Well, there's not much else to do, but the group still is going to head to the future and needs to wait for the time machine to refuel, so they train in the meantime. While they train, Whis tells Beerus that he has a hunch as to who Vegeta Black is, so he, Shin, and Beerus take an early trip to Universe 7 during the group's training. Given how future Broly has already mastered his wrathful form, present Broly and Gohan don't have much trouble training him. With Broly's knowledge of himself, and Gohan's longtime mastery of the form, they're actually able to get future Broly to tap into Super Saiyan, although very briefly. He definitely has the power and ability to do it, he just needed some help from someone that could help him control it and actually access it. Trunks achieved it through anger, and knew that it would be a very bad way to get Broly to transform. Cause if he were to make Broly angry to transform, that wouldn't have ended up well, it would have just killed everyone. So he actually never taught him the form, but this way is actually a lot better and actually lets him access it for once. And of course, Trunks trains with Vegeta and catches up with Gohan, and everything goes pretty smoothly in the past. But just to make sure the future is entirely safe, now with a bigger time machine, the group of Trunks, Vegeta, Goku, Gohan, and the two Brolies are about to head to the future. However, Beerus and Whis stop them before they can time travel, because they feel they know who Vegeta Black actually was. After visiting Universe 7, they deduce that the key was most definitely Zamasu's, which was exactly what Whis predicted, and after hearing Zamasu's views on mortals, it's safe to assume that he did it, but they have no solid proof yet other than accusations. They tell the group to look out for him in the future and see if he really is the one responsible, and they'll monitor Zamasu in this timeline. If he is there, they won't miss him, they'll know it's him. The group knows that there may be danger, and they have to get to the bottom of whatever Zamasu did to make Vegeta Black evil, or whatever caused Vegeta Black to even be a thing. So in the future, they arrived at the destroyed city and meet with Mai and the civilians and help them out as usual, but they can't spend too much time here, that's not their main mission. Now. They have to see if there's still a threat here in the future, and see if Zamasu is behind this and how he accomplished it. With no Vegeta Black, they should be fine right now, and they won't have any threat other than the possible threat of Zamasu. Meanwhile, on the same timeline, Zamasu is getting pretty nervous. Vegeta Black hasn't returned yet in a few days, and Zamasu can't even sense his key. He could continue his plan alone, but it might not be enough. First, he actually has to find out if Vegeta Black died. Suddenly, he senses some large key sources approaching. This is the first time Zamasu is actually nervous, despite his immortality. So, you must be Zamasu, Trunks says. The group wastes no time and launches a full assault on him, completely destroying him. In terms of power, he's outmatched, but he keeps regenerating and the group finds out about his immortality. His anxiety turns to confidence as he explains what happened and what he did. The group is worried now seeing that he's immortal and will keep regenerating. After finding out about Zamasu's immortality, no one knows what to do. I could go the Zeno route, but that just feels like a cop-out. And Goku doesn't immediately remember that in the original story, so it wouldn't make sense for him to just remember it out of the blue here either. For the time being, the group is able to escape Zamasu and return to the present. Right now, they have no idea what to do about Zamasu's immortality, so once again, they have no option but regrouping. They don't have access to the Super Dragon Balls right now, and while Earth and Namek might have working Dragon Balls, it's doubtful that they'll be able to work on other timelines because of their power. They ask Beerus, but Beerus won't help them by going there himself to Hakai Zamasu because it breaks the rules of time travel and he doesn't want to get involved with that nonsense. While thinking of ways to counter Zamasu, Goku gets an idea and he flies over to Kame House. He's going to learn the evil containment wave. However, Gohan and Trunks come up with a different idea. After finding out about the time ring, they want to try to fight fire with fire. While Beerus won't help, maybe Shin will considering how dire the situation is. They want to see if Shin will use a time ring of his own and travel to with them to get the Super Dragon Balls for themselves. I left a poll at the end of the last part, asking whether or not Shin would help Gohan and Trunks, or if he'd be stubborn about time travel kinda like Beerus is, and the majority of you voted that he would help. And I agree, Shin is very pragmatic compared to Beerus, and even though they shouldn't abuse time travel, this is necessary and will actually help everyone, and isn't really an abuse of that. For anyone also confused about if Shin can actually use the time ring, he can. I saw a few comments on the last part asking about whether he could even do that, and it's not exclusive to the Universe 10 Kais. As far as we know, they're the only ones who have possession of the time rings, but they're not the only ones who can use them. Any Kai can really use them, and even in the manga, Shin actually does use one. So yeah, he can use them, they just need to travel to Universe 10 to actually get one. So Gohan and Trunks are going to contact Shin through Dende, and Shin brings them to his planet with Whis and Beerus there as well. 
The two of them tell Shin their idea, and he actually agrees, thinking it's a great one. Beerus is mad that they want to time travel, but Shin assures him that this time travel won't upset Zeno since he could do it anyways, it's just the reason for it is a little worrying. Beerus doesn't want to be involved in any way and just goes to take a nap for a bit. Whis takes the three of them to Universe 10, where they meet Goasu. Already knowing the situation, Goasu allows Shin to use the time rings, and Shin travels a year into the future and spends some time there collecting the Dragon Balls. Since it's a little time consuming and he might need a translator, Whis also heads along with him to help, and Whis doesn't even need a time ring to do so. Yeah, I guess from the ending of the Future Trunks arc, the angels can just travel through time and they have a lot of broken powers like that. Whatever, I'm not gonna question that. And this is the first time they find out Whis could actually do this, so that's why they didn't ask him in the first place. But it doesn't really matter, it's better to have two people going rather than just one. The two of them work together to collect the Dragon Balls. And once they do get them, they don't wish to remove Zamasu's immortality. Gohan and Trunks actually had a better idea for a wish that they told the two of them. The wish is much more powerful. It's a wish to remove Zamasu from any timeline that he could possibly exist in, immortal or not. Not only will this save Trunks' timeline, but any other timeline that may have their own Zamasu will get their Zamasu erased as well and they won't have to worry about it. Since for all they know, Zamasu could have already been traveling to other ones to get other Zamasus to join him. I wonder if that means he'd be erased from my other what ifs since they're kinda different timelines. Kinda weird. Anyways, jokes aside, Zamasu is now completely erased in every reality as Shin and Whis head back to their normal time. That seems relatively simple. They all head back to Universe 7 and await the results. Goku meets up with them soon after, ready to fight Zamasu. He's pumped up and he's actually prepared this time with the container and the seal for it, and he's ready to use the evil containment wave to seal Zamasu, thinking that this will be the end-all be-all for Zamasu. His excitement slowly fades once Gohan and Trunks tell him what actually happened, but he doesn't really care that much because that means Zamasu is no longer a problem. It just means that he can't fight him himself. Alright, problem solved, and they told Goku about it, but where is Vegeta and the two other Brolies? They find Vegeta at the time chamber as he exits with the two Brolies, with both Brolies wearing the exact same clothes because Bulma made some new ones for future Broly. And this leads to a pretty odd but humorous encounter. Vegeta thought it would be a good idea to train with the two Brolies in the meantime, since he didn't know what to do with them, and they weren't really doing anything either. So he essentially has two Broly bodyguards next to him, and now with the change of clothes, no one could tell who's who. They didn't stay in the time chamber for that long because there wasn't really that much food for three people for a whole year, but they still got some good training out of it. Vegeta just goes off and lets everyone figure out which Broly is which by themselves. It's not his problem and each Broly knows which timeline they belong to. Other than the Brolies, this just leaves everyone confused. To make sure everything worked, Whis actually heads to Trunks' timeline and sure enough, Zamasu's gone for good. Knowing that the Super Dragon Balls must have worked, and thanks to Whis' scouting, Trunks and Broly return to the future with some extra fuel in case they ever need to head back. They thank everyone for the help, and they're happy that it was pretty easy to get rid of Zamasu, a lot easier than they thought. All the fighting, destruction, it's all finally over. The time machine disappears as they say goodbye, with Trunks and Broly returning to build their future back to normal. And that's the conclusion to this arc. For the next few months or so, life returns to normal as everyone goes back to their daily lives. The Saiyans all continue to train with Beerus, except Gohan and Vegeta fall behind a little bit due to Gohan needing to work and take care of Pan, and Vegeta now needing to be with Bulma while they wait for Bra to be born, but that only happens in the later months. Goku's goal now is to power up further, as Broly is also trying to achieve Super Saiyan Blue for himself after tapping into God. Goku considers trying to teach Broly how to combine Wrathful with Super Saiyan, so he can get his own version of Wrathful Super Saiyan, but Broly doesn't really need it right now. He'd rather focus on getting Broly to use Super Saiyan Blue, and they can work on Wrathful Super Saiyan after he gets that. Since Wrathful Super Saiyan in this scenario is more of an upgrade of the base form, whereas Super Saiyan Blue is a separate thing entirely and much more important. The roles actually switch this time between Gohan and Goku. When he occasionally visits, Gohan helps Goku access Mastered Super Saiyan Blue, while Gohan is interested in learning Wrathful Super Saiyan while he's there. Broly fully devotes his time to learning Super Saiyan in Blue. During this time, Goku ends up meeting Zeno again, and this naturally leads to the Tournament of Power being set up, except there's one less Zeno. For the exhibition match, Goku, Gohan, and Broly are the ones participating, and it's very easy for them. I kind of wrote myself into a corner here because now this is getting very similar to my what if about Gohan training after Boo, but don't worry, this one may have a few similarities, but it's going to be entirely different and go in a completely opposite direction from that one. If you're interested, I have a playlist for that what if that you could check out. I'll link it at the top of the video. Now the group must recruit some fighters. After Whis helps Bulma give birth to Bra, they have four members now. Goku, Broly, Gohan, and Vegeta. 
In order to be more efficient, they split up and try to recruit their own members, and after everyone recruits some members, they'll decide on a final team later. Gohan goes with Goku, and Broly goes with Vegeta on their own. After about a day, the two small groups meet up with their own candidates and tell each other who they have. Goku and Broly recruited Krillin, 18, and through 18 they recruited 17, as well as potentially having Tien join just in case. Tien's not a definite answer yet, but he might come in later. So they already have three new members totaling at 7, and potentially 8 if they need Tien to join. Gohan also got Piccolo to join on his own, so that's 8 members they have, 9 with Tien. As for Vegeta and Broly, they didn't get as many members, but they still got some pretty good ones. Broly is a little bit worried, and everyone sees why once Vegeta brings future Trunks and future Broly out. Goku is also freaked out because he doesn't know how Zeno will react, but Vegeta calms everyone down and tells them that he had Whis check with Zeno to make sure it was okay, and Whis was the reason he was able to go to the future in the first place. While it was kinda reckless, Vegeta is smug in the end because he got better fighters, and he didn't need to bribe them like Goku did with Krillin in 18. Oh yeah, and once he brings that up, the whole bribe discussion comes up, but that gets sorted out. So now, Universe 7 actually has a pretty solid team. They don't even need to recruit Tien. Goku, Gohan, Vegeta, Broly, Future Broly, Future Trunks, Piccolo, Krillin, Android 18, and finally, Android 17. After they sort the whole bribing thing out, the team is able to come together and form a strategy. Krillin, 18, and 17 are pretty much as strong as they were in canon. In Part 7, I mentioned how Piccolo got access to God Key, and while he doesn't get a new form, this still makes him way stronger, and he's now a godlike Namekian, I guess that's what we could call it. You know, the name doesn't sound too bad, it's pretty much like how Goku and Vegeta became godlike Saiyans by having their god key and base form. In terms of future Broly and future Trunks, future Broly got Super Saiyan 2 when he visited the past, and after that, he was able to achieve Super Saiyan 2, but that's pretty much all he has. Trunks has been training, but he never learned how to use Super Saiyan God, so while he might have access to God Key, as does future Broly due to both of them training with Vegeta, both of them can only use Super Saiyan 2 at best, but they're still very strong regardless. Having God Key makes them more powerful either way, even if they can't utilize it properly and get a new form. And besides, it doesn't all come down to power. Technique and strategy are something that they have down to a T, and they fight very well together and have a lot of synergy. After his training, Goku has mastered Super Saiyan Blue, and obviously Gohan has it as well, and that's the most powerful form that they could both use right now. Broly now has control over Super Saiyan God, and has tapped into Super Saiyan Blue very briefly, but he can't use it, at least not at will, and he can't really control it when he does end up tapping into it. Vegeta's current max power is Super Saiyan Blue, and he has attempted to use Master Super Saiyan Blue, but he doesn't really have it down yet. As for Goku, Vegeta, and Gohan, they all have figured out to basically use Wrathful Super Saiyan with so much efficiency that the amount of stamina they use is like being in base form, so they really don't use any stamina at all, at least when it comes down to maintaining it. Similar to how Goku and Gohan in the original story use Mastered Super Saiyan in the Cell Saga and remain in that form during the 10 days, they're gonna kinda do that here with Wrathful Super Saiyan, and they'll be using this form instead of staying in base, and only drop out of it if they need to switch over to any of their god forms. This will not only help them train the form even further, but it'll give them a nice boost in power instead of just fighting in base, without them having to use too much stamina. With the team now ready, they head to the World of Void. The tournament begins and now everyone is able to show off their true power. Right away, Universe 9 gets eliminated like normal, and everyone fully realizes how serious this tournament will be. Especially once everyone gets a sense of the power from the other fighters, specifically one named Jiren from Universe 11. And the fighters from Universe 6 are there too and pretty interesting. They recognize Hit and Kaba, and there's also two Saiyans beside them. Every universe has their own powerful foes, and one of the universes is already gone. While Goku and Vegeta didn't follow the plan that Gohan had to stick together, most of the other fighters from Universe 7 remain close together, and will only split up if necessary. They're only a few minutes in, but things are heating up way too much already. Seeing as the fights are getting more and more intense, as a leader, Gohan decides that everyone should split up. Goku and Vegeta are off on their own, so the remaining 8 members split up into small groups of their own. First we have the fight between Universe 7 and 4, which goes pretty normal. Krillin ends up being the first one eliminated again. Poor guy. Oh wait, no he's actually saved by Piccolo, who is able to stretch his arms out and catch him. That was kinda concerning for Beerus, but good thing he was fighting alongside Piccolo. Without Frieza there, Frost is just going on a spree picking off whoever he can, and Krillin ended up being one of them. 
The two of them end up facing up against Frost, along with 18, and Piccolo alone would have been enough to defeat Frost easily, so this is just overkill at this point. If you remember a few parts ago, Piccolo was able to access God Key, and he hasn't really got any practice with this new divine power, since he only really fought in the Universe 6 tournament. He's impressed to see how strong he truly is now, as well as the fact that he sees that his training and his access to the divine key is paying off. The groups continue going around getting into fights. Broly is with Gohan, and they're able to pick off some Universe 6 fighters like Batamo and Mageta pretty easily, and this gets the attention of Kalifla. The two of them end up splitting up, since they're both experienced and strong enough to fight alone. Realizing that Gohan, Goku, and Vegeta are all Saiyans, as well as that guy Broly, she's kind of curious about the form that Gohan, Goku, and Vegeta are using, and wants to fight them and learn about it. Kalifla is no match in this fight, even as a Super Saiyan 2. Remember, this wrathful Super Saiyan form is much stronger than Super Saiyan 3, and it's kind of like Super Saiyan 4, but not exactly the same thing. They look the same in their axis in similar ways, but the way they use it isn't exactly like Super Saiyan 4. But yeah, that's still essentially what it is. Due to Gohan basically being a master of it, and it being more powerful than Super Saiyan 3, it's essentially a powered up base form for them, meaning no stamina drain. Gohan's fighting Kalifla, and he doesn't use it as an opportunity to train Kalifla like Goku did, but he doesn't take it entirely seriously either by knocking her out right away. He's impressed with her power, but he knows that it makes her a potential threat. After playing around in the fight a bit, he ends up blasting her off the stage knowing that she'll be a threat once her power keeps growing. He doesn't treat this the way Goku did. This makes Kale enraged, and she powers to her berserk legendary Super Saiyan form right away. Gohan immediately drops out of Wrathful Super Saiyan to turn Super Saiyan God, knowing that the form Kale is using is just like Broly's and shouldn't be underestimated. He overpowers her to the point where she drops out of the form, and he's able to knock her out, but Hit is actually trying to step in to save her. Seeing how the strongest fighters in Universe 6 are fighting Gohan right now, Broly steps in and tries to stop Hit. Gohan eliminates Kale, with Broly now facing off against Hit once again. He assures Gohan that he'll be fine alone, so Gohan goes off to join Piccolo and eliminate some other fighters. Knowing that Broly will see through Hit's timeskip now, and probably break through it, Hit decides to fight Broly one-on-one -on -one without any tricks. He could use his time lag and trap Broly, but he'd rather save that in case he needs to fight someone like Jiren, since restraining Broly with it would cause him to lose all his power. The two of them begin to fight and are pretty even, with Broly eventually overpowering Hit and Super Saiyan God. Realizing that the situation is bad, Hit decides to break out his time lag and trap Broly, even though he wanted to save it. He does so and Broly is now unable to move, and Hit uses this as an opportunity to try and knock Broly out. Until he's caught off guard by a tackle from another fighter. It's Broly? Hit's confused, but then he remembers he saw that other Broly before at the beginning of the tournament. Future Broly has stepped in to save his alternate self, and this allows Broly to break out of the time lag. While Future Broly isn't nearly as strong, he acted as a good distraction and now the two of them are able to fight Hit, ending up with them overwhelming Hit and throwing him out of the ring. Universe 6 has already lost its three strongest fighters, and only has a few left thanks to Universe 7. The two Broly stick together for now, so let's transition over to Universe 2. Vegeta and Trunks are fighting together and facing off against the fighters from Universe 2. They're able to eliminate some of them pretty easily, with Rebrianne being the biggest obstacle. Being pretty annoyed by Rebrianne, Vegeta decides that they need to get rid of her now. He and Trunks don't want to waste any time, so they go directly to their full power, and end up taking her out with a few others with a father-son Gallic gun. And on the other side of the arena while this is going on, 17 and 18 knock out some Universe 2 opponents on their own. It's weird for Trunks because he already met the now good version of Android 18 in this timeline, but he hasn't met the reformed 17 yet, so this is one of his first encounters with 17 after he's turned good. Just thought I should point that out, it's a little weird for him. You know, the last time they saw each other they were both trying to kill each other. Universe 7 is performing pretty well, they've eliminated some strong opponents from other universes already. But this isn't even the beginning. Jiren is still meditating, he hasn't even stepped out to fight anyone yet. This gets Goku excited to fight Jiren. The two of them end up facing off and Goku does a lot better than he does normally. This is one of the first times he showed off Super Saiyan Blue Kaioken in the scenario, and with the extreme control of mastered Super Saiyan Blue and the power boost of Kaioken, along with the huge increase in power Goku got from training, he's actually able to fight against a heavily suppressed Jiren. Keep in mind, I said heavily suppressed Jiren. This isn't like full powered Jiren we're talking about. And Goku knows that Jiren is holding back, so he decides to break out his spirit bomb right now. With the energy gathered, Goku launches it and pushes it towards Jiren with all of his power. 
The Spirit Bomb is actually a lot harder for Jiren to push back this time, and he begins to struggle against it because of the power it holds, and how much better Goku is able to push it back. But once Jiren releases more power, well in Jiren's words, it's over. This causes the Spirit Bomb to collapse and leads to Goku tapping into Ultra Instinct Omen for the first time, pretty much like the original. But the fight is very different. Since Goku is much more powerful in this timeline, even without being able to attack properly in UI Omen, he's able to put up a pretty good fight against Jiren and causes him to power up a little bit more. Jiren is pretty surprised at how strong Goku is, but he's still no match and Jiren is eventually able to defeat Goku. With Goku a little drained, he's found by the two Brolies and they try to protect him for now. Krillin and 18 are the first two to be eliminated from Universe 7, and the other universes are being picked off one by one. Universe 6's remaining fighters are defeated, with Kaba being the last one standing. Seeing as no one is going to interrupt, the one to fight him is Vegeta, who actually even is a playing field as they both fight in Super Saiyan 2, a form that's essentially useless for Vegeta. He just wants to test Kaba's abilities now. He still has a soft spot for Kaba and uses this opportunity to get him to unlock Super Saiyan 2 for himself. Vegeta knows that only one universe will be victorious, and sadly he knows Kaba won't be strong enough to fend for his universe alone. He makes a promise that no matter what, he will revive the young Saiyan in his universe. It's a bittersweet moment as Vegeta has to knock Kaba out of the ring and erase his universe, but Kaba's hopeful and confident that this isn't the end. He says his goodbye to his master, and Universe 6 is erased. Vegeta is now in a sour mood, but this is how it was going to end anyways for Universe 6, and he's at least glad that he was able to train with Kaba again. Vegeta wants to win now and bring them back. The only fighters remaining are those from Universe 11, the robots from Universe 3, and some fighters from Universe 4. But once the Universe 4 fighters' tricks are exposed, Universe 4 is the one to go next. But along with them, Future Trunks and Future Broly are knocked out by the fighters from Universe 4. This is what gets people to realize that one of them is invisible and one of them is really small. So that lets them knock the Universe 4 fighters out even though they already lost Future Trunks and Broly due to it. Aniraza is formed by Universe 3 and he's defeated pretty easily by Universe 7, who still has 6 fighters left. Their numbers made them a big target for Universe 3, but they're somehow able to manage still, because now it's just them and Universe 11. Universe 11 only has a few fighters left, so they need to take out some people from Universe 7. Dispo is actually pretty easy to take out this time. Piccolo and Gohan handle him pretty easily, but now they face Topo who's in his God of Destruction mode, knowing that he needs all the power he can get. Jiren doesn't even bother to intervene. But the fight is kind of unfair since it's 6v1 against Topo, which is what makes him want to transform. And he puts up a decent fight, but he's ultimately eliminated. And now it's the remaining fighters Universe 7 vs Jiren. Goku can't access that Ultra Instinct thing that he did before, so now they decide to strategize. They need as much power as possible, so first, everyone starts off by powering up to their maximum power. Goku tells Broly this as well, and even though Broly is strong in his god form, Goku knows that Broly has more within him. With all the training they've done together over the past year, and the few times he's seen Broly briefly access the power of Super Saiyan Blue, Goku helps Broly power up as Broly is aware that he needs to attempt this. Goku knows it'll work, and it does. Broly is able to finally access Super Saiyan Blue and maintain it for a bit, and although he struggles to use it, the power he's giving off is insane. Even with it though, everyone isn't sure if they can defeat Jiren. They need to combine their strategy and power to win this. This is the final fight, and everyone attacks with all their might. The Saiyans launch towards him, with Piccolo and Seventeen staying behind as support. Seventeen throws up barriers in front of Jiren as everyone lunges towards him, blocking Jiren's key blast and creating a smoke screen. The Saiyans are able to reach Jiren thanks to the help, and are now overwhelming Jiren greatly. With Broly and Vegeta in Super Saiyan Blue, Gohan in Mastered Super Saiyan Blue, and Goku in Mastered Super Saiyan Blue with Kaioken, that's kind of a mouthful, Jiren is losing a lot of ground. Whenever there's an opening, like when Jiren is about to counter, Piccolo is on the sidelines with some clones and charging multiple special beam cannons to fire at him. While these attacks would normally kill other people, Jiren isn't one to be mortally wounded by this, but Piccolo's special beam cannon combined with his exponentially higher power now allows him to get some decent hits in on Jiren when there's an opening. Whenever Jiren tries to retaliate these hits, Piccolo is protected by 17, as Jiren then gets attacked by Super Saiyan Blues for trying to refocus his attention. And think about the sheer power of the Saiyans here. Blue Goku and Vegeta are already stronger than they are in canon, and Goku's in a better form of Super Saiyan Blue, with Vegeta actually trying to control Super Saiyan Blue himself like Goku's doing. And on top of that, they have mastered Super Saiyan Blue Gohan, and a Super Saiyan Blue Broly is here as well, both of whom are even stronger than that. 
Plus, Jiren already faced a decent challenge from Goku when he went UI Omen earlier on. So now Jiren's actually getting closer and closer to using his full power, since he now has a serious challenge. The four Saiyans, who all got even stronger since the beginning of the tournament, plus the support of Seventeen and Piccolo, creates a situation where they're overwhelming Jiren greatly. During this time, everyone comes up with a plan. They need to hold Jiren down and destroy the ground beneath him to knock him off. Their power now is good enough, but they can all tell Jiren still isn't fighting seriously yet, and if he powers up fully, then they'll have a lot more trouble taking him out. Power isn't how they're going to win this, they need to have a strategy on top of that. This will be a hard team effort, and they have one shot, but it might work. Jiren is powering up further, and getting annoyed, and before he reaches his full power, everyone knows to act quickly. Jiren's getting pushed closer and closer to the edge and is about to be knocked off. Before he powers up fully, the Saiyans push him to the edge of the arena. Now's their chance for a big gamble by Gohan and Broly. The two of them use all their power to grab Jiren from behind, and right away, Goku knows what they're trying to do. They need to sacrifice themselves. Seventeen focuses on throwing up barriers around the three of them so they can't escape, and while Jiren is restrained by Gohan and Broly, they're all trapped within Seventeen's shields which are increasing in number quickly. Vegeta, Piccolo, and Goku work together, with Vegeta launching a final flash and Piccolo launching light grenades alongside his clones to push them back further. Jiren is about to break out of the hold, but before doing so, Goku jumps up in the air above Vegeta and Piccolo, launching a Hexa Destructo disc that he picked up from Krillin. Jiren ends up breaking out as Gohan and Broly fall into the void, but it's too late. Goku broke the ground below them with all his destructive discs, and Jiren is falling as well, with Goku and Seventeen now joining in on blasting Jiren off with all their power. Jiren can't fight back now, and he can't even jump back to the stage because he has no footing beneath him, and thus, Jiren is eliminated, leaving four fighters from Universe 7 behind. Goku never ends up mastering Ultra Instinct, and Jiren never actually got to go full power, thanks to some coordination of Universe 7's last fighters. So who gets the wish? Well as for an MVP, they can't choose it based on who's remaining in the ring, as there's more than one person. In this scenario, I feel like the MVP that they'd select would be Goku or Gohan, since Gohan had the most eliminations and did pretty well as a leader, while Goku was really good with strategy and weakening Jiren, as well as helping Broly power up. Since Goku's still on stage, I'd say he gets the MVP nomination, and while he's not sure what to wish for at first, he then decides to wish for every universe to be restored, since he looks forward to fighting some of these strong contestants again. And that's the end of this story. Well, at least for now. This what if was pretty fun, but it's not over yet. This ending is only temporary. Broly still hasn't actually learned to use Wrathful Super Saiyan, and we still have the Moro arc to do. I'm gonna leave a small poll. Since I can't do the Moro arc yet, would you guys like me to cover Future Trunks' timeline for this what if? Some of you asked if I'd cover what happened for Future Trunks in more detail, and what happened in his timeline following the Cell Saga, as well as what happened in his universe after the defeat of Zamasu, and potentially after this tournament. Let me know by voting in the poll, but otherwise, we'll have to wait until the Moro art concludes before we make another part for this. Thanks to everyone for supporting this What If series since the beginning, and as always, remember to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for notifications about future parts to this What If, and any other videos of mine. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.